All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Gray. I'm an instructor here at the Regina Flying Club. And uh, this presentation here is with regards to uh, multi VFR training on our flight school aircraft, the Piper Seneca 200T, the PA 34. Um, now, this is my second attempt at this video, so hopefully it goes a little bit smoother. My hope is that uh, this video should detail a lot of the basic principles and uh, policies of the school here, uh, specifically related to our own aircraft. However, the things that we're going to talk about today should be generic enough that other people could be able to use it and apply it for their own purposes. Specifically, just talk about the basics of uh, multi-operation, multi-flying, how it's a little bit different from the single engine uh, aircraft that you might be used to. And uh, in addition, for my own students here, getting them ready for the, uh, the multi-groundwork for the flight test. A lot of it does derive on the principles of performance and systems, and uh, we'll talk about that here shortly. Anyways, we've got a nice picture here. That's the, like I said, the Piper Seneca PA34-200T. The 200 refers to the 200 horsepower that each engine produces, and the T refers to the fact that it's turbocharged engines. Now, this is going to be one of the first differences that you'll notice between the, uh, the single engine and the multi, is that with turbocharged engines, there are a couple of limitations that you can't just bring your throttles all the way to full. Uh, you can put yourself in a situation called overboost in that situation where um, you can degrade the performance and the, uh, the power generated by the aircraft if you go too much. Uh, so we have to be very careful that we don't just set our throttles all the way up to the 100% uh, the range. Uh, otherwise, it could be a detriment to the performance of the aircraft. Typically speaking, the, the throttles in this aircraft generally don't go more than about halfway up. Uh, that's on takeoff, that's in stall recoveries, that's in overshoots, that's as much as you need. And even at uh, like low altitudes uh, that we're working with, that's, that's going to be plenty. The only time that in this aircraft you'd see you'd need uh, maybe full throttle is going to be at its uh, operating ceiling, which is up to 25,000 feet. So this is quite a, a, a capable aircraft. The other nice thing about this aircraft, you'll notice that, uh, first of all, the picture there is, uh, I took that picture, it's a pretty spiffy looking plane. That is a 1976 aircraft though, so it's getting on... Uh, over 40 years old, 44 years old now, I think, if I do the math on it. This is being recorded in February 2021. It does have a nice slick new paint job on there. Uh, the one thing I'll say about this aircraft is that it's uh, it's a very nose-heavy aircraft. It's got a very elongated nose, and that makes it great for the, uh, the stall characteristics of this plane. It's very difficult to stall, but very easy to recover. And uh, in our stall lessons, you'll find that actually works in our benefit. Uh, other things to know about this aircraft is that this is actually called the Seneca II. And uh, the couple changes that they made when they produced the Seneca II is that the Seneca one they found uh, experienced a lot of pilot induced oscillations where the pilots were, you know, they're, they're overdoing the yoke because the plane was very, uh, I want to say unstable, but very pitchy, basically. So as a consequence for this uh, aircraft design, they made the controls uh, deliberately feel heavier so that uh, you really have to deliberately put this aircraft into a nose up or nose down attitude to get it to climb or descend. And same is true for the ailerons. You really find it's gonna be very heavy on the controls. So you will be using the trim wheel a lot. The big thing to remember with trim is that you should still strong arm the yoke in whatever direction you want, and then you trim to relieve the pressure. Never fly the trim because if you're flying the trim, you might over trim one way and then you have to start trimming all the way back and then you just end up playing games with yourself, basically. So it's not a very efficient way to fly. So hold it, strong arm it where you need, and use the trim to relieve the pressure. But it's a very stable platform. Uh, it's an excellent uh, aircraft for the flight school. You'll notice as well that there are a couple black surfaces on the propeller roots and the uh, wings themselves. This aircraft is certified into known icing. In practice, uh, we limit the exposure that we have for that. There's a couple of uh, regulatory compliance things that we have to do, particularly related to the training of both the student and the instructor. The instructor needs to be certified into icing conditions. But also, you'll notice that little wind, uh, that little square on the, uh, the windscreen there. That's the, uh, the heated surface for clearing ice off the windscreen if ice does collect. And the problem with this is that even if it's... Um, you as a pilot sitting in the left seat have a clear view for the runway and after you've been, been exposed to icing, that doesn't mean your instructor has. So being using judicial use of when we apply this aircraft icing conditions will be uh, important. And we're always gonna hedge on the side of safety guys. We're not gonna go flying if it's gonna be any question that the instructor has the ability to see outside. So don't get too excited about the idea of uh, icing conditions in this aircraft. But anyways, let's get started here. Uh, let's see, let me try. I'm going to bring up the chat window as well. I'll make general comments as we go. And um, yeah, let's get started. So things we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about what the critical engine of an aircraft is. This is a new concept that you'll come across in multi-engine uh, flying. 
We'll talk about what the minimum controllable airspeed is. And this is probably going to be the most important concept that we talk about uh, in, this, in this lesson here, because um, this is the kind of stuff that could mean life or death, really. Uh, we'll talk about engine failures. And engine failures, honestly, are not that bad as long as you protect your airspeed. There's a couple of drills. There's some memory items that you'll need to go through to make sure that all the necessary things are taken care of. Um, but this is part of your training for the, the multi-engine. Obviously, when we're in a single engine, we do forced approaches or precautionary landings, simulating that we've had degraded engine performance for the, the single engine aircraft. In a multi-engine, we're gonna do the same kind of thing, saying, okay, if you lost an engine, what would you do? And it will be an exercise on the flight test. So we'll make sure that you're ready for that as part of your training. What we're going to talk about here though, is the, um, the, the basic initial memory actions that need to be done uh, in order to keep yourself safe. And then we'll talk about single engine maneuvering, which is really a, not much to do with that. It, 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 the plane handles and performs a little bit differently with a uh, single engine, but yeah, it's not a huge deal. Anyways, let's talk, talk, start talking about the big differences in the way that the aircraft is going to perform. So first of all, with that second engine, the aircraft is going to accelerate very quickly on takeoff. And this aircraft, it has a lot of punch right after takeoff. What you'll find is that, and in my experience, like I've flown many different aircraft, anything from turboprops all the way up to large jets. And this has got one of the, the quickest accelerations uh, of most aircraft that I find. Those turbochargers, when they spool up, they really push you into your seat. And that's nice. It's great initial thrust on takeoff. However, the top speed tends to bleed off pretty quick. So what you'll find is it's got the initial push. And then once you accelerate, then that's all it's got. Um, but with two engines, you know, more thrust, more redundancy, which is good. But let's talk about the, how our aircraft in particular might be different from most other twin engine aircraft. So we have something in our aircraft called uh, counter rotating propellers. And the principle of this is that the propellers work against each other. They're not both going the same direction. And there is a design feature. And there's a reason for that. We'll talk about that here shortly. Um, but what you'll need to know is that these propellers are in the engines themselves are mirror images of each other in most, um, general, in most commercial aircraft that are multi-engine, they have something called conventional twins where both propellers are going the same way. And the purpose for that is it does make it slightly more difficult to control in an engine out situation. And even with both engines operating, you might find that especially the Q400 need to be very active on the trim wheel with the rudder to, uh, to keep the plane flying straight at all times. But the nice thing about having two engines that are going the same direction is that you can swap parts out on them. So if you have you know, a, a malfunctioning engine, you need to replace a part, well, then that's fairly easy. You can just find another spare part and plug it in there. Whereas if you have counter rotating propellers and you have to replace a part, then you have to know, okay, which, which version of the engine am I replacing the parts? So you almost have to have double the parts for those engines. So it does increase the operational cost for that. Um, so yeah, conventional aircraft are easier to, to maintain, a little bit harder to control. A counter rotating propeller aircraft is easier to control, but a little more expensive to maintain. So that's the basic difference there. Our PA-34 Piper Seneca II is a uh, counter-rotating propeller. And this is common for most training aircraft because they are, you know, like I said, when you're learning to fly with single engine, you want to kind of start in the shallow end before you go into the deep end. Uh, but let's talk about why that's the case. Why is it uh, beneficial to have a counter-rotating propeller? And it's come back to the idea of moments. Now, when you probably were exposed to moments before in the single engine category. It was when you're talking about uh, weight and balance. You're saying, okay, here's my, where my center of gravity is with related to my reference datum and telling me if I have an aft center of gravity, that means my aircraft will perform in a certain way. If I have a forward center of gravity, that's usually more advantageous, gives me more better performance characteristics, better stall characteristics. Uh, and basically what an, a moment is, it is from a given reference point, there is an arm or a lever from where that force is applied. And then the action of that force at a 90 degree angle from the arm will produce a moment. Now, generally speaking, when we talk about single engine, we say that that force was a weight from the reference datum and it's causing a moment or a weight to act around a center of gravity. Now, when we're talking about a multi-engine aircraft, we're not so much concerned about weight, we're talking about thrust, how a thrust moment affects the performance of an aircraft. Because you can think of uh, the longitudinal axis of the aircraft, the center line to be your, your starting point. And the engines are exerting a force at a certain distance from that center line of the, of the aircraft. So the further out those engines are, the, the longer the arm and the more moment that they will generate. Now, obviously, if we're talking about aircraft control, you know, specifically rudder authority, if the moment of those um, of those thrust vectors or the arm of those engines is very small, where the arm, the engine nacelles are very close to the fuselage, 
it's going to exert a very small moment and it gives my ability, my rudder the ability to, to counteract that much easier. If I have a very large arm or my engine nacelle is very far away from the center line of the aircraft, then my rudder needs to be either bigger or further away from me to counteract that force. So that, those are the kinds of things that you need to keep in mind when you're operating in a multi-engine aircraft. So let's talk about the different uh, forces that can affect a multi-engine plane, specifically when we talk about the engine failure scenarios. So we have two different pictures here, and each one of them are trying to describe, first of all, it's a conventional twin. So we're talking about both propellers are going the same way. And if you recall from your single engine training on takeoff, and on the climb out especially as well, at high power settings and high nose up attitudes, you'll find that the aircraft really wants to wander to the left. And that's because of something called asymmetric thrust, which is the principle that the downgoing propeller blade of your, uh, of your propeller is going to, for lack of a better word, scoop more air. It's going to grab more air. And it's going to cause the aircraft to yaw the, to the left. The more detailed explanation about that is that the, uh, with a aircraft in a nose up attitude, the downgoing propeller blade uh, is basically a wing. It's just a wing that's turned sideways. And what it's doing is it's encountering the relative wind flow at a higher angle of attack that produces more lift. Now, when we talk about lift, generally we say lift acts upwards on a wing. But when I turn that sideways and I'm talking about propeller, I can say that the, the downgoing propeller produces more lift or a more succinct way of describing that, saying the downgoing propeller produces more thrust. And as a consequence, that extra thrust causes the aircraft to yaw and turn. So that's what asymmetric thrust is. And I do have a nice little picture over here basically showing the, the same idea. Now, the principle is that the aircraft has to start with a gentle nose up attitude. If you're in a, a zero pitch, which in most aircraft is actually a descending attitude, because to keep main, maintain level flight, you do need a little bit of nose up. But in a slight nose up attitude, it's the downgoing propeller blade, which encounters, encounters the relative wind at a slightly higher angle, produces more thrust. Now, again, a single engine, it's a yaw thing. So you, you need to apply right rudder. And as long as you apply enough, the plane will go straight. It just means you have to be a little more eye aware of where you're, you're, you're looking at your inclinometer or the ball on the turn coordinator. You need to look at that a little bit more and just make sure that stays in the center on takeoff and on climb out and pretty much any phase of flight really. But coming back to the idea of a multi-engine aircraft is that when you're, you're flying a multi, depending on whether you've had an engine failure or not, the asymmetric thrust of the downgoing propeller blade can be more significant uh, again, depending on which engine has, has failed. So if I'm dealing with a situation on the left here where my right engine has failed, the downgoing propeller blade of the left engine will produce more thrust than the upgoing propeller blade of the same engine. But because that thrust, that extra thrust vector is fairly close to the center line of the aircraft fuselage, the moment or the yawing tendency of this uh, engine will be fairly limited. I should be able to easily control it with the rudder. On the other hand, because my right engine also has a downgoing propeller blade on the right side, and because now that downgoing propeller blade is farther away from the aircraft fuselage center line, that is going to generate a larger moment because the arm is more significant, causing a bigger yawing movement. So in an engine uh, failure scenario, asymmetric thrust is going to be more adverse or less preferred if I have a situation where the left engine has failed. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, I said, this is the second time I'm recording this video. So I've already been talking for an hour and a half and I'm already starting to lose my voice. Uh, so hopefully this, I can get through this in one piece here. Uh, so let's talk about the, the idea of a critical engine. So we said, obviously, if there's different asymmetric thrust depending on the engine failure, one is a preferred scenario. And obviously I'd rather have my right engine fail than my left. The right engine failure would be you know, bad, but not as bad as a left engine failure because of that, that thrusting moment. So we say a critical engine is the engine which, if lost, will most adversely affect the performance and handling characteristics of the aircraft. Uh, now, there's many different reasons why the left engine may be critical. And we gave one already saying asymmetric thrust. There's actually four reasons why the left engine becomes critical. And we'll talk about those here shortly. But another reason why um, an engine may be deemed critical is because the systems associated with that uh, might be necessary. And what you'll find is that uh, in turboprop aircraft, they have something called an accessory gearbox, which is basically the turbine produces more rotational energy than it needs, and it can be used to supply power to other systems. And one of those systems might be like pressurization or uh, the landing gear. So if you lost a certain engine, you might not have the ability to deploy your landing gear in the conventional fashion. Now, the nice thing about a twin or any complex aircraft is that there should be redundancies on the system. So there should be backup systems 
uh, in the event of a failure of the primary system. And this is going to be something that our examiner in particular likes to ask in the groundwork saying, oh, if you lost your landing gear, what would you do? And you need to be familiar enough with the um, systems of the aircraft to know not just how your normal system works, but also how the backup system works. So as a brief kind of introduction here, I could say that my landing gear normally operates as an electrically act to activated hydraulically actuated system, which means I'm, I'm moving a little, little lever in the cockpit that's electrically powered, but then that electrical signal is sent to the hydraulic pumps and it hydraulically uh, releases the landing gear to the down position. So electrically to start to communicate the signal, but the hydraulics are the ones that actually do the work. Now, in the event of a failure of my uh, electrical system, or if the hydraulics fail, I have a, a, a loss of hydraulic fluid, how can I get that gear down? So, well, okay, we have uh, a manual gear deployment and basically you would you pull a pin in the cockpit and it, it removes the pin on the gear holding it up and they deploy by gravity basically uh, until they get to the lock position. So that's the backup system for the, the gear. Now, thankfully our landing gear does not operate on the principle that it needs an engine to operate, but some more complex aircraft do. So that's a reason why it might be considered to be a, a critical engine. Uh, now, a critical engines aren't something you only find on aircraft that have uh, our conventional twins where both propellers are going the same way. If you have a, an aircraft that has uh, counter rotating propellers where both propellers are going against each other, and I'll show you a nice picture here. So that would be like, the right engine has the downgoing propeller blade on the, on the inside. And so now the arm for both engines is going to be the same. The, the, the asymmetric thrust kind of cancels each other out uh, when they're both operating, which is nice. So two engines operating, they're going to be pretty much equivalent thrust. You will need very little rudder on a counter rotating propeller aircraft to keep the plane going straight. It's unlike a, a single engine where on a single engine, you always need a little bit of right rudder and a counter rotating propeller twin engine aircraft you don't, which is, which is the great thing about it. You need very little rudder. The only time you would ever really need to buy even a minute, and I'm talking just a, a hair touch of rudder, is initiating or in the turn to keep yourself coordinated as you're gently rolling into a banked attitude. Uh, but even then, it's a very small amount. So be judicial with your use of the rudder. Uh, if anything, I would say less is more when it comes to the rudder. So coming back to these ideas of um, a critical engine, again, only applies for conventional twins, does not apply for... Um, counter rotating propellers. Uh, but here are the four things. If you did have a conventional twin, what are the four conditions that kind of cause you to have a critical engine that cause that yawing tendency to the left? And it will always be to the left. Uh, it's just doubling up. You know, in a single engine, it, it definitely wants to yaw to the left. In a double engine, you've got two things wanting to yaw to the left. So it becomes more significant. Again, the, uh, the idea here that if you're flying uh, any kind of commercial aircraft, like a commercial turboprop, basically like a uh, Dash 8 ATR, King Air, something like that. Uh, they'll have a very strong left turning tendencies. The um, turbo fan aircrafts where they're jets, uh, you don't have these same issues. Um, there should be, there would be a little bit of overlap, but I think there's extra design features in terms of how the tail is designed in addition to, um, um, you're not quite spinning an air, a mass of air the same way as a propeller is. So your yawing tendencies will be reduced in a jet aircraft. Anyways, the four factors that are used to determine a critical engine is the, you know, we use this acronym called PAST, P-A-S-T, stands for the P factor, which is another fancy way of saying the asymmetric thrust of the downgoing propeller blade. Uh, a, it stands for accelerated slipstream. And when you talk about slipstream in a single engine, you basically talk about something called spiraling sl slipstream, where the propeller moves a mass of air around the fuselage of the aircraft and it strikes the tail and it causes the plane to yaw in a certain direction. Uh, we over, we kind of simplify it. I don't want to say oversimplify, but we, we kind of leave out this idea of accelerated slipstream because it, it really is more of a concern for multi-engine aircraft, but there's two kinds of slipstream that we can talk about. So I'll explain the difference there. Accelerated slipstream, spiraling slipstream, and uh, the last one, torque. So let's get into more details about what these are. So P-factor, we already talked about this, I'm not gonna dwell on, but the downgoing propeller blade creates more thrust, more lift technically, uh, and it causes the aircraft to yaw. Now, if you're in a multi-engine aircraft, uh, the right engine with the downgoing propeller blade being further away from the center line of the aircraft will create a more adverse yaw. As a consequence, that's the least desirable condition. Therefore, a failure of the left engine is going to be least desirable. That's considered my critical engine. Um, so I'll just briefly run through the notes here. The, so P factors, the effect where the descending propeller blade is producing more thrust than the ascending pro propeller blade, technically more lift. 
Um, right engine failure, the yaw is small. A left engine failure, the yaw is large. This is the most adverse effect. Therefore, the left engine is critical. If the left engine fails, the P factor being produced from the right engine is farther from the longitudinal axis of the aircraft, creating a greater yawing movement. For those of you keeping score, this is the first condition causing the aircraft to yaw to the left. Let's keep going. Uh, now we have something called accelerated slipstream. And this is an interesting one because we say for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And what you'll find is that not only is the downgoing propeller blade produ producing more uh, lift or more thrust, it's also, we say for every action, equal opposite reaction, gonna push more air behind it. Now, because more air is being pushed behind this propeller, you basically, if you had two people standing here, like two wing walkers, this is a terrible metaphor, but if you're standing here, you're gonna get more of a blast of air on this side than you will on this side. As a consequence, because a wing, produces lift by airspeed. So the more air you have flowing over a certain part of the wing, the more lift it's going to produce. So that if you are looking at this side, the wing root is going to produce more lift than the, the center of the wing over here because of the, the massive air that you've pushed behind it. On the other hand, the right engine is going to do something a little bit different. So the downgoing propeller blade still produces more thrust. It's still going to push more air behind it. But because all that air now is being pushed over a section of the wing that is farther away from the center line than the left engine, this part of the wing is going to produce more lift instead of the wing root. As a consequence, if you have a failure of the left engine in this situation, the right wing will produce more lift farther from the center line, and that will cause a rolling motion away uh, in the direction of the failed engine, basically. Now, this is going to be a little bit harder for you to control as well, because how would you fix that? If you had a failure of the left engine, and now this right engine is producing more lift farther away from the center line, and it's causing the aircraft to roll, well, then you're going to use the ailerons. But the problem is you can see that the aileron out here is fairly close to the um, where the lift is being produced. So the leverage that it has to stop that roll is going to be diminished. On the other hand, if I have a right engine failure, well, then my, yeah, the extra lift this wing is producing is close to the fuselage. So yeah, it's unfortunate, but I will have greater aileron authority to roll the plane back to where it needs to be. So again, in this situation, the failure of the left engine is going to be the less desirable state Therefore, the left engine is critical. So that's two reasons. In addition to that, because of this effect, this is a rolling motion now that causes the aircraft to want to roll again to the left. Now that's basically what this picture is trying to show you here, saying that I'm producing more lift on the outer skirts of this wing, causing more of a rolling motion, a rolling moment. Uh, and I already said all this stuff. The next kind of slipstream we have is spiral slipstream. And that's, again, the one that you probably be familiar with from your single engine training. But let's talk about this because the picture actually does a decent job with this. So let's imagine I've had a situation where the right engine fails. So this is the only engine that's producing thrust. So first of all, this aircraft, this one engine operator is going to push the plane over, right? It's going to say, oh, I want to push the plane to the right. All right, so it's going to try to yaw to the right. However, the slipstream coming back from this, it spirals and always bows kind of in the direction uh, that is tumbling. So if you spin it in one direction, it kind of corkscrews in a certain direction. So what you'll find is that it'll actually corkscrew its way to strike the left side of the vertical stabilizer. And that kind of cancels out the yaw, correct? I was going to say cancels out the yaw, right? But I don't want to get my rights and lefts mixed up here. So I have... Um, a force of thrust causing the aircraft to yaw right because the engine is the only one left that's operating. <laughs> it's the only remaining engine operating. But at the same time, the uh, slipstream strikes the tail and it causes the aircraft to yaw back to the left. So those forces cancel each other out. On the other hand, if I have a failure of the left engine, I don't get that canceling out effect. This uh, airflow that comes back from the engine, it just spirals off into nothingness. It doesn't strike the tail of the aircraft. So what happens is I have a yawing motion where this single operating engine is pushing the plane to the left, but now there's no counteracting force on the tail. There's nothing pushing on the tail to stop it from turning. Uh, and so that's another thing that's going to push the plane to the left. Now, this is a yawing force again. Um, so yeah, so then in this situation, we say that is the less desirable state. Therefore, I don't want my left engine to fail. That is the critical engine. That's three reasons. Now, the last one here we have is torque. 
And torque is kind of a, it's a funny one to think about. So let me just kind of put the picture here. And the answer I'm gonna tell you again, it's going to be the left engine is critical. I don't want the left engine to fail, but let's talk about why. So first of all, we say Newton's, I believe it's third law for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If I have both propellers going one direction, the plane wants to roll in the other way. So for a conventional aircraft, the propellers from the cockpit's perspective, the propellers spin clockwise. So that's causing a torque counterclockwise. Now, if I have a failure of the right engine, well, what's happening here is that the aircraft still wants to torque to the left because of this engine that's operating. However, I've had a failed engine. So the plane naturally would just kind of drag into that direction. It's just going to say, oh, I don't want to go. Like it's, it's the, the operating engine is going to push it into the failed engine. So those forces kind of work against each other. We're saying, yeah, the plane wants to torque to the left. It wants to roll to the left. But if I've had a failed engine over here, this good engine wants to push me to the right. So they cancel each other out. So that's not too bad. On the other hand, if I have a failure of the left engine, well, not only does the plane want to torque left, but the remaining engine that's working wants to push you left. So those forces double up. So that's another reason. That's four reasons why the left engine in a conventional twin aircraft, uh, failure of that engine would be considered critical. It would be a really bad situation. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean you're going to lose control. You still have enough rudder authority, provided you maintain a safe airspeed. And that's, we're going to start talking about uh, minimum controllable airspeeds. And the whole premise of that is making sure that you're going fast enough that your rudder has enough air over it to stop these yawing motions. The great thing about our aircraft, because it is a counter-rotating uh, twin, um, you know, these asymmetric thrusts are going to be fairly minimal. Uh, so easy to control, easier to control, but you'll still have to be on the ball in the event of an engine failure. Uh, now, the other thing that you'll notice when we get into twin, we have a couple more V speeds. Now, V stands for velocity, but these speeds that are going to be important for twin operation. And what you'll, you know, in single engine, we talk about uh, best angle of climb speed. And if I write in the comments here, best angle V X, and the way I remember that is the letter X has a lot of different angles on it. Uh, best rate of climb speed, V Y. So again, the difference between those two, best angle. Climbing to altitude in the shortest amount of distance, best rate, climbing to altitude in the shortest amount of time. Now, in a twin engine aircraft, best angle is almost never used. Best angle, unless you're specifically doing a takeoff from a short runway with, you know, tall trees or buildings at the end and you need to clear those obstacles, then yeah, you'd use best angle or, you know, if you're trying to do a short field effort. But in our practice, in our training, best rate of climb is what we're going to do on normal takeoffs. Best rate of climb is what we're going to do if we have uh, engine failures in the overshoot, which is something that we'll practice in the training area. And just by the by, when we start practicing, uh, we will do lots of engine failure drills as part of your multi-training. The um, We will practice engine failures in cruise flight. We always do those at our cruise altitude. We're not going to do that close to the ground because we want to give ourselves a healthy margin of safety. But we'll also do practice engine failures on the in the overshoot, but we will not practice those in an actual overshoot low to the ground because... You, know, you might only be 200 feet above ground and that's not enough safety for us. So what we'll do is we'll end up simulating an overshoot at you know, cruise altitude, basically. Here in Regina, we'll be at 5,000 feet. We'll slow you down. We'll put the gear down, flaps down. And then we'll simulate the overshoot from that point just to give ourselves you know, that extra safety. Um, but let's talk about some other speeds that you'll kind of encounter in the twin or multi-engine operation. So the first one we're gonna talk about here, flap extension, VFB. Uh, again, FE stands for flap extension. The, uh, you would have seen this in the single engine aircraft, but we'll kind of review it here as well. The, we have a couple of different flap settings in particular with our aircraft, the Piper Seneca. We have, uh, well, actually four flap settings. So we have flap zero and flap zero is the only setting that you can actually use to, to use the flap as a step. So when you're boarding the aircraft, there's a little bit of grip tape that's on the wing route where you board through the uh, right side of the, the cabin. And there's also some grip tape on the, the flap itself. It is a step, but only when the flaps are at zero. So that's the first thing to remember. If the flaps are not at zero, don't step there. Anyways, we have flaps zero. Uh, and to deploy the flaps, we have kind of like an e-brake lever between the two pilots where it's a, a bar that's on the floor. And to deploy the flaps, you basically lift it up and it clicks into notches. Uh, so to, to as you lift, it just naturally clicks into the next detent. If you want to retract the flaps, what you do is you push a button on the top of the, the, uh, the lever, and then you can release the flaps to the floor, which that brings you back to the flap zero position. The, um, 
uh, with the flap retraction, don't just push the button and drop it because the plane will suddenly reconfigure. Uh, and it's not good on the system either. It can be hard on the, um, the, the mechanism itself. So guide it to the floor gently you know, if you can. Um, but yeah, we have uh, four different flap settings. So flap zero, flap 10, flap 25, and flap 40. Those are the four flap settings that we have. You may occasionally hear me referring to things like flaps one or flaps 45. Ignore me. Those are my old policies and old callouts. And sometimes they do creep into my, my briefings and uh, my verbiage when I'm flying. So flaps 45 was an old flap setting that I used when I was in the, um, in the airlines. And uh, flaps one was another flap setting we used. So ignore me if you hear me say those kinds of things. Um, I was getting to the point at one point where I was saying them so frequently that even my student was starting to say the same thing. Like not deliberately, not to make fun of me, but he was actually saying, oh, flaps 45. And I'm, like, oh, that's, I'm sorry, I, I, sorry I let you down that I've been doing this so much, but yeah, it's only flaps 40 uh, for our aircraft. And we do have different speed limits for each flap. And that makes sense, right? Because if you're going to go, uh, the faster you go, the less flaps you'll be able to deploy without over speeding them. As you slow down, you can use more flaps. So you can see here on the presentation, the speed settings that were the, the flap speeds are as follows. So for flaps 10, you can deploy them at a, up to 160 miles per hour. And that's the other thing to mention. This aircraft is specifically measuring speeds in miles per hour. Uh, it's not in knots. And that's just a limitation. The aircraft, it's a 1976 design out of the US, right? So uh, if you look in the pilot operating handbook, which I actually just have right there, uh, it's uh, the speeds are in miles per hour, the temperatures are in degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you know, it's before we got to the modern age. So, uh, so it's a requires a little bit more conversions uh, than I'd like, but this is what we're working with. So miles per hour is what we're dealing with here. Anyway, so for flaps 10, it's 160. For flaps 25, uh, it will be 140. And then for flaps, I was about to say flaps 45 again, but for flaps 40, it is uh, 125. Now that doesn't, that's not to say that as soon as you get to 125 miles per hour, you can go all the way to flaps 40. You'll give it a little bit of room. You know, I would say you'll give yourself at least a five knot distance just to give yourself a margin of safety because you don't want to risk accidentally overspeeding the flaps. Uh, in practice though, what we generally just use is that a speed of 125. If you're below 125, you'll go from flaps zero to whatever you need. If it's on approach, we'll just use 10 degrees of flap on approach. If it's on um, uh, our engine failure in the overshoot, we go straight to 40. So we don't actually in practice use flaps at anything more than 125, but these are speeds out of the POH. So just know for our purposes, 125 is the flaps speed that we're gonna use. The other thing I can say here is that um, landing gear extension. So VLE, that's what that stands for, landing gear extension. And, uh, or I should say landing gear extended speed, not extension, because I'll go into details here what that means. So this is the highest speed that you can operate with the gear extended. And when it comes to landing gear, there's basically three ways that you have to look at this. There's a speed limit for the extending, the act of deploying the gear. There's a speed limit for how fast you can go with the gear stuck out. And then there's a speed limit of how fast you can go in the process of retracting the speed, or sorry, retracting the gear. So let's talk about those individually. If I want to extend the gear, if I want to deploy the gear, uh, our speed is 150 by the POH, but in practice, again, we use a little bit of a margin of safety is 140. So flaps, the speed is 125, but in practice, 120. Gear, the speed is 150, but in practice, 140. So try to keep that straight in your head. Um, but yeah, if I want to extend the gear, 140 miles per hour is what I'm going to look for in the uh, uh, airspeed indicator. That's the speed I can use to extend it, and that's the speed I can use to fly along at. However, if I want to retract the gear in our aircraft, we actually have a limit of 125 miles per hour. And the purpose for that is because the nose gear specifically in this aircraft, it, uh, it retracts upwards and forwards into the nose. So when I deploy that gear, it comes out into the wind flow which means that when I'm retracting it, the motor that operates the gear has to fight against the wind flow. And we don't want to burn out that motor by going too fast and producing too much resistance against it. So that's why it's 125 miles per hour. Now that's actually not a major problem because on takeoff, our normal climb out speed is going to be 120 miles per hour. So as long as you pitch to maintain 120, you can gear up at any point. You won't be any faster than 125. So there's no concern there. However, where this becomes a factor is if you're going to be doing um, either a stall recovery or engine failures in the practice area where you're going to be accelerating very quickly, 
Uh, like I'll give you an example. One of the exercises we're going to do in the practice area is going to be the landing configuration stall, where we will actually have the gear deployed and the flaps fully extended, and then we'll have you stall the aircraft. Now, this, the recovery for a stall in a twin engine aircraft is just like the recovery from a single engine. You lower the nose, you increase the power, but then you have to remember, oh shoot, I've still got the flaps and gear out. I need to make sure I retract those in a timely fashion so that I don't overspeed them. Um, now, every aircraft, has a different policy for how you should retract things like gear and flaps in an overshoot or in a recovery. And typically they look at things like what's the first airspeed restriction that you're going to hit. Now in our aircraft specifically, the POH says it's gonna be flaps first and then gear. And that makes sense because we said our flap limit, what we use in practice is 120. And then our gear retracting limit is 125. So which is gonna be first do I wanna get up? As well, the flaps is the speed I'm gonna hit first. So I wanna get that one initially. So I'm gonna lower the nose, increase the power, and as I mentioned before, when it comes to a turbocharged aircraft, I'm not bringing that throttle all the way up, even in a stall recovery. I'm only going to bring it really around the halfway mark, enough to create the power that I'm looking at thrust, but in, just by looking at the throttle lever angle, it's only about really halfway up. Um, and it might depend, differ depending on whether it's a hot day, warm day, depends on your altitude and other stuff like that. But just be careful that you don't just fire while you're throttle. But in a stall recovery, lower the nose, increase the power, retract the flap, so click, release gently, putting it to the floor, and then gear up so that you don't burn out the motors or overspeed either one of those limitations. So those are the speed limitations for flaps and gear uh, on our aircraft. And the flap retraction always happens first in the recovery. Um, other speeds, so we talked about VX and VY in, sing, uh, in the normal single engine PPL, CPL, but now when I talk about single engine in the multi configuration, I'm meaning an engine failed situation. I'm only having one that's, that's giving me thrust. So when I talk about VXSE, that's our single engine best angle of climb. So specifically, it's the best angle of climb speed with a single operating engine in a light twin aircraft, the speed that provides the most altitude gain, altitude gain, per unit of horizontal distance following an engine failure while maintaining a small bank angle that should be presented with an engine out climb performance data. And a small bank angle, when you have an engine failure, uh, it's generally about three to five degrees of bank angle. We say that we raise the dead. So that if I have a failed engine on my left side, then I'm gonna pick up the left engine and bank into the good engine because that right engine naturally wants to push me to the left in, in my example here. So I wanna lean into the good engine so that um, uh, it's going to produce less of an adverse yaw for me. And now in our aircraft in particular, our best angle single engine rate of climb speed is 90 miles per hour. And that is kind of getting on the slow side of things. Uh, we rotate at 80. Uh, so single engine best angle 90, it's, it's on the slow side of things, but specifically it's bringing us very close to something called our minimum controllable airspeed or VMC. And uh, this is an important one because uh, we don't want to get anywhere close to that airspeed. That's where we start to lose control and where the thrust from the remaining operating engine can actually overcome my rudder authority. I won't have enough airflow over the tail to stop the yaw of the aircraft. Uh, so don't get too slow. This is why generally in flight test standards, we say our, um, our airspeed targets are going to be plus 10 minus 5 um, not or miles per hour, because it's always safer to be on the plus side of things. I'd always rather be a little bit faster than a little bit slow. Anyways, uh, the next B that we'll look at here, best angle single engine. So best, sorry, VYSE, best rate single engine. It's been a long day. If I flub the words, then please, you know, bear with me. Anyways, uh, best rate of climb speed with a single operating engine in a light twin engine aircraft, the speed that provides the most altitude gain per unit of time uh, following an engine failure while maintaining a small bank angle in the, the, in the direction of the, the good engine. And in our aircraft, it's 105 miles per hour. And it's such an important airspeed that it's actually delineated by a, a small blue line on the airspeed indicator, at least for a normal gauge. If you're looking at a you know a round circular gauge, uh, if you're flying a G1000 or something like that, it'll just be a... a a little note on the speed tape. So you'd, you'd program that ahead of time to make sure it's set. Uh, so if you're doing an, a, an engine failure in the overshoot, you need to get to altitude, it's going to be this speed that you target in the climb. Um, yeah, so we'll get into that more detail in a second here. V speeds, now this is kind of where we get into the, the meat and potatoes of the lesson here, because these are speeds that really, we're not gonna be using in the training environment here, but it's a nice introduction, it kind of brings you the idea of what you'll be using in the uh, airline or um, you know, serious commercial operations, particularly. You're not really gonna see these when you, even if you fly in the bush or fly turboprops up in like Northern reserves or anything like that, but it's, it's good to talk about, get, 
introduce the idea. So V1, what is V1? Uh, it's basically our go, no go decision point. We say it's the speed beyond which takeoff should no longer be aborted. The idea being that if you try to, to reject the takeoff beyond that speed, you probably don't have enough runway left to stop and you'll probably go off the end of the runway. So your better option is just to go take off and deal with the emergency in the air. And it's a twin engine aircraft. It should be more than capable of dealing with that emergency. You'll still climb. You might not climb as quick, but I'd still rather deal with the emergency airborne uh, than not. And generally speaking, that when you're at a high speed, uh, the, the best option is usually to stick with the plan uh, and to just continue your takeoff. When you make last minute changes to reject the takeoff, you better be damn sure that you got the room to stop. Uh, V2, this is our takeoff safety speed, the speed at which the aircraft may be safely climbed with one engine inoperative. So what generally happens in a normal takeoff is that you hit V1, your go no go decision point, and if you experience, experience an engine failure at any point after that, you're going. But you still probably are on the runway. You haven't rotated yet. So then you have to hit your rotate speed. And then you have to continue to climb up. And basically what V2 is saying, now that you've reached the speed, you can, okay, I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm going to have the climb performance that I need to get myself safely above the altitude. But you'll notice there's a bit of a gap there. They're saying, well, let's come up with an example here where the ro rotate speed's 80. My V1 speed, actually, let's come up with different numbers. My rotate speed's 100. My V1 speed, my decision point might be 80, and my safe climb out speed might be 120. So if I have an engine failure at 90, so I'm halfway between V1 and V rotate, I'm still going to go. But the thing to remember is that you still got one engine operating. So it's still producing thrust. It's still accelerating the aircraft. You might not be accelerating as quickly as you would with both engines, but eventually you will reach the point where you get to that 120 V2 takeoff safety speed. So it's just saying, you're gonna take a little while to get there, but when you get there, you're safe. So that's what that means. Now in, in practice here, our takeoff safety speed is basically going to be our VYSE, our best rate single engine climb speed, 105. Um, and VR rotation speed, same as it is for single engine aircraft. The speed at which the pilot begins to apply control inputs to cause the aircraft nose to pitch up, after which it will leave the ground and that's 80 miles per hour on this aircraft. Now I do have a comment here. Uh, it says some back pressure on takeoff in the Seneca makes for a smoother ground roll. Um, be very judicial with that. I'm kind of walking myself back from that comment because um, we're not doing a soft field takeoff technique as part of the, the uh, the multi-engine aircraft. It's just in this particular aircraft, because it is very nose heavy uh, and you don't want the nose wheel bouncing on the pavement, basically a gentle, small amount of gentle back pressure just before you reach that 80 miles per hour, just to make it a smoother takeoff roll can be useful, but don't overdo it. You know, we're, we don't wanna risk having a tail strike in the aircraft where you know there's not much clearance on the tail there. So being very small with our, our back pressure application. Um, I was going to say something else here. I lost it. So we're going to keep going. Um, okay, so let's talk about what a balanced field is. Now, this is something you might find in your, you probably won't get it in an IFR NRAD exam. You probably may see this in an ATPL exam. So we'll, we'll introduce the ideas here. And basically what a takeoff, uh, well, let's, let's talk about some basic principles here. So let's say, uh, let's talk about accelerate stop distances. If I'm doing a takeoff, um, and let's say I have an engine failure at any point, I need to decide, am I going to continue that takeoff or reject? So let's imagine I decide to reject. If I'm accelerating my aircraft, and I'm only at like 20 or 30 miles per hour. Well, of course I'm going to reject because the, the distance it's going to take me to continue that takeoff and to accelerate to my rotate speed and climb out safely is going to be ridiculously long because I've only got one engine doing the majority of the work because the engine failure happened at such a low speed. So my accelerate go distance is going to be quite large, but the distance it takes for me to stop if I had an engine failure at 30 miles per hour is going to be nothing, right? It's going to take me no time at all to stop that aircraft. On the other hand, if I'm accelerating down the runway and I'm at like 75 miles per hour, okay, I've now got a lot of inertia, a lot of momentum. The distance it's going to take me to stop if I decide to reject at that point could be quite large because, you know, not only am I thinking about the inertia of the aircraft, I also have to think about the runway conditions saying, well, what if it's an icy runway? What if it's a wet runway? What if there's a hydroplaning risk? Uh, I mean, what if I have a tailwind? There's a lot of these things that if I'm a very heavy aircraft, there's a lot of factors to come into that would affect my stopping distance being considerably large. On the flip side, if I have very high airspeed and I have a failure, 
um, my accelerate go distance might be a little bit shorter because I'm pretty close to my rotate speed. I should be able to keep accelerating and make it to that safe V2 climb out speed in a fairly short distance. So there's a balancing act here where you're saying, how, what is the distance it takes for me to accelerate go? And what is the distance it takes for me to accelerate stop? And what you're going to do is you're going to choose a V1, a decision point where both of those distances are the same. So we have a picture here showing that the point where the engine failure takes place, uh, which is where this, this blue line turns to yellow, is trying to show you that the distance remaining for this takeoff is going to be uh, my accelerate distance will be the same as my accelerate, my accelerate go distance or my takeoff distance required. It's going to be the same as my accelerate stop distance. Now, when those, both those distances are equal, we say that we have a balanced field. Uh, and the reason why a balanced field is useful is because that can tell me where my probably the most efficient placement of my V1, saying that my decision point is as high as it possibly can be uh, for me in this, in this condition, saying that I'm, that's the latest point I wanna decide whether I'm going to reject or not. So just a nice little picture showing the same thing, an accelerate go distance or my takeoff distance required. So I start my roll, I'm picking up speed. Uh, I have an engine failure if I decide to continue and just by the by your V1 decision speed, depending on the regulatory authority that you're dealing with, sometimes they factor in a reaction time for your engine failure decision because they realize that if you blow a tire on takeoff, or you have an engine failure, it might take you a moment to identify fully what's taking place because a blown tire isn't always immediately apparent, especially if you've got more than one tire on the same landing gear. Uh, same thing with an engine failure. Sometimes it takes a while for the, the thrust being produced out of the engine to to decrease and you won't actually initially notice any adverse yaw from a failure for a first second or two. You might see an instrument start to wind down and you might start to get some warning flags, but you still don't quite know what's going on. So they sometimes factor in about a one to three second reaction time into your V1. Uh, different regulatory authorities and different policies might change this, but generally speaking, they do factor in a reaction time. Anyways, for your accelerate go distance, it's giving you, it's the distance required to make the decision to have an engine failure, make the decision to go, and then to take off and clear the end of the runway by at least 35 feet above ground, above the far end of the runway. Um, now that 35 feet is significant when you get into your IFR rating because, um, well, we'll talk about when you get to your IFR. Anyways, the accelerate stop distance is pretty much the same idea. It's just that you have an engine failure, you make the decision to stop the aircraft. So thrust to idle, brakes and uh, spoilers will be deployed and then you'll come to a stop. And as long as both those distances are the same, that's considered the balanced field. Uh, so your V1 is at the highest speed it possibly could be. So to achieve a balanced field takeoff, engine power is selected to provide enough acceleration so that the lowest possible speed to continue the takeoff uh, in the remaining distance necessary, the takeoff distance with one engine not working is equal to the remaining and necessary distance to accelerate stop. I fumbled the words, but you guys can read it there. You see what I said. Uh, V1 usually balances the field. V1 identifies an engine failure speed where the diff distance to abort and the distance to continue the takeoff are the same. So that's how we come up with our balanced field. Uh, and now let's talk about the differences between a high speed and low speed regime, because in, um, in our training environment here, we don't really use that. Even in the turboprop world, I hardly use that. It's only something you really use until you get to you know, jet operations. But generally speaking, we say that below 80 miles per hour, the aircraft can be, can be considered to be in a low speed regime, whereby a rejected takeoff can be done safely with a minimal danger to aircraft components and crew. Maximum braking may not always be required, but why not hedge on the side of safety? Why not still apply maximum braking? Because you don't know how long it's going to take that plane to stop. Even if you did the calculations ahead of time, I'd rather apply full braking and overdo it instead of underdoing it. Uh, and deceleration forces may be nominal. A rejected takeoff or RTO should be performed for any major malfunction which occurs at the speed range. So if I'm taking off and I get any kind of a master caution, master warning on a more sophisticated aircraft, or if I get an unusual reading on my performance instruments, I'm not taking the risk, I'm stopping at that point because the consequences of rejecting are low in that situation, whereas the consequences of continuing uh, with a faulty aircraft could be high. Uh, so some minor malfunctions may also necessitate a rejected takeoff, uh, such as electrical malfunctions and errant instrument indications. So it's up to the discretion of the pilot command and whether they want to reject in this low speed regime. Uh, but I would say any major malfunction, and for our purposes, a major malfunction is any fire, failure, or loss of control of the aircraft. If you experience any of those three prior to 80, no chances, stop that aircraft. Um, you can still go with other things. Like I said, 
you could go with electrical problems, whatever, if you want to, but why take the risk, right? Stop the aircraft, figure it out. If it's fine, okay, then you come around and you'll line up and you'll do another takeoff, but better to sort it on the ground instead of in the air. On the other hand, when we get into the high speed regime, this is where things become a little bit more critical. Your decision on to reject must be made with the, uh, first of all, the best of information you have at the time, but uh, the best of intentions because you don't accidentally want to go off the end of the runway for a non-issue. Uh, and usually speaking in the, in the high speed regime, it's usually best just to continue the takeoff and sort it out in the air at that point. So above 80 miles per hour, the aircraft can be considered to be in, in the high speed regime, where it is, whereby a rejected takeoff should be only executed in the event of the aircraft's inability to become airborne. Uh, we say maximum braking will be necessary, so it's a definite must. Brake overheat is highly likely, and for that reason, you could have a brake fire. Now, in a simple uh, twin engine like ours, brake fire is almost almost impossible, but you could have a brake line failure. The brake, the um, the hydraulic fluid could leak onto the uh, the brakes that could cause a fire. So, and a, and a rejected takeoff. If it's a, it's a serious one and you're concerned about the risk of a fire, then yeah, don't be afraid to call a pan pan and request the fire trucks just to come check your brakes. You know, it's not, it's no harm in doing that. Um, be judicial with that. I mean, don't do it unnecessarily, but uh, something to keep in mind. Deceleration forces will be high. A rejected takeoff should only, or should be performed for only when a major malfunction occurs in the speed range. Again, fire, failure, loss of control. If you have a minor malfunction in this area or something we consider a, if you get a master caution, on takeoff. And just for your familiarity, when you're flying a sophisticated aircraft, you have big red light and you have a big yellow light. The yellow light says something's wrong. I don't like it, but the plane should still fly okay. The red light's like, I need your attention right now. So when you have a major malfunction, it's a red light. If you have a minor malfunction, it's a yellow light. So if I'm taking off and I'm above 80 and I have a minor malfunction or a yellow light and a minor malfunction, again, could be electrical issue. If it, if it was a night flight and my electrical lights completely burned out, uh, I might put that in the category of major, but you know every situation is different. Uh, but minor could be, um, come up with a good minor example, maybe a comm failure, something like that. Something that, okay, it's gonna suck, but I'll be able to deal with it. Um, you wouldn't reject for something like that at the high speed range, regime. Uh, come back to these ideas of V, uh, v speeds. The most important one that we're gonna talk about here is VMC. So I'm just gonna draw your attention initially to the, um, the airspeed indicator here. And the first thing you'll see is that the airspeed is pegged at 105 miles per hour. And I did pick this picture. I got this out of Google um, images. It conveniently shows the same single engine best rate of climb speed that our aircraft has, but I don't know if this is from a, a Piper Seneca or what it's for, but the blue line is the single engine best rate of climb speed, 105 as it happens to be in our plane. Again, that's, that's the, if you have a failure on takeoff, that's the speed you're gonna climb up at. If you have both engines operating, we actually do climb at 120 miles per hour. So slightly faster, which is good because if you have an engine failure on takeoff, it gives you a little bit of, you can trade speed for uh, altitude uh, to protect yourself. In any case, um, this red line here, this is called VMC. This is your minimum controllable airspeed. Do not ever go below this airspeed. VMC, minimum controllable airspeed, the minimum speed at which the aircraft is still controllable with the critical engine operative or inoperative, I should say. Uh, if you look at our POH right yonder, uh, it says 80 miles per hour. However, we do have uh, the modification on our aircraft that allows us to use the reduced VMC. So we have actually increased performance. And I believe it has something to do with the vortex generators we have on the leading edge of both of our wings. Uh, that actually reduces our VMC. It gives us um, better control characteristics at low speed. So our VMC in the Piper Seneca is actually 72 miles per hour. Uh, and we have um, an airborne VMC and we have a, a ground-based VMC, sometimes referred to as VMC-A for airborne or VMC-G for ground. And the airborne one is just the idea being that if I have an engine failure, and this is only true for engine failure scenarios, but if I have an engine failure, and even if you have two engines, you don't wanna go close to the speed. I mean, this VMC specifically relates to an engine failure, but if I have both engines and I'm at like 80 miles per hour exactly, that's a precarious position to be in. If an engine suddenly fails, I'm already at my minimum control of airspeed. I go, oh no, things are, things are gonna start happening quickly for me and I don't wanna be in that situation. But um, VMC A, so that's the airborne speed. So if you have a failure of the critical engine, Below that speed, your rudder will not have enough aerodynamic authority to stop the yaw of the remaining operating engine. And eventually it just pushes you over and you basically get into what's called a VMC roll or basically a spin. 
where the, the plane starts spinning towards the ground. And that's nasty. Um, when I was an instructor uh, starting out in the Moncton Flight College back in 2009, we had an incident where uh, a student and instructor uh, were returning from the practice area and they were 3,000 feet above ground. And on the return, they were practicing uh, maneuvering at reduced airspeed, which is basically like slow flight. And um, at the point of the recovery, as I understand it, I think the, uh, the student when he was beginning to accelerate the aircraft, accidentally pushed one throttle up. He didn't push them both equally. And because they were already at reduced airspeed and he jammed the throttle on one side, he was at you know basically VMC and the plane entered that role. And unfortunately the instructor to his detriment, he was sitting back with his arms crossed. And so when something happened, he, he did react quickly to try to grab it, but it was a little bit too late. And uh, the aircraft basically entered that, that VMC role. Now, if you ever find yourself in that situation, you basically, you need to regain airspeed no matter what. Now, in a nose down, if you're spinning, your, your plane will accelerate, but to uh, accelerate, so the first thing you wanna do, if you experience this, is you wanna lower the nose to gain airspeed, to give your rudder more authority, but then you wanna slam your throttles to idle because that engine is the, that's operating at full blast is causing the problem. So you need to return yourself back to a coordinated state lower the nose, accelerate the plane. And then once it's under control, then you can slowly bring back both powers together. But that's how you're gonna recover from this uh, situation. When this happened in, uh, in well, it's actually the Fredericton campus. It was the Moncton Flight College Fredericton campus. And um, they lost 3000 feet in a heartbeat. They, they did get control, but they were in such a nose down attitude that by the time they tried to pull out, they were just cresting the bottom of the dive and they, hit the ground and they went into the trees that mock chicken like they were going fast um elt went off and uh, the rescue crews went out there to find them fortunately they lived um the shocking thing about this is that the the student pilot he did lose his medical for a while i did i do think he made a full recovery there was even an observer in the back seat a passenger that was watching and he was just along for the ride and he i think he was okay the instructor himself, uh, it was such a violent G-force in the um, impact that all of his internal organs shifted by one centimeter. Uh, like they did x-rays later to see how he physically was. So, I mean, so it was dramatic. Uh, the plane was totally destroyed. It took them, I think, um, two hours to get to them because they were in dense brush. They had to bring in the helicopter to drop guys down into the, the trees to come get them. Um, but they were all okay. Uh, okay, eventually, basically. And the, uh, the instructor, he eventually was found culpable. He was the uh, responsible authority on that flight. He was fired <laughs> to add insult to injury because of that incident. Um, and just as a, I guess as a silver lining to the story that just because you make a, a terrible mistake and he did make a terrible mistake, um, you can still you know, have a, a decent career in front of that because he, uh, he did push through, he eventually found work and he, um, as last I heard, he was working for Air Canada. Now I, I'm recording this in February of 2021. So whether that guy still works there or not uh, because of the whole COVID situation remains to be seen, but yeah, it was an unfortunate situation. Uh, anyway, so it's coming to the idea of uh, don't, go below, don't go close to VMC, even when both engines are operating. This is idea of our safe single engine speed. So due to the inherent risks of operating at or close to VMCA, oh, and I should say, come back here. The difference between airborne VMC and ground VMC is that in some aircraft, and this is particularly true of tail draggers like DC-3s, is that if you have one engine fail, like let's say I'm on the apron and I start up one engine and I try to taxi, um, I, that engine is producing so much thrust, I might just be steering myself in circles. So you might actually need to have a little bit of forward speed first uh, with two engines before you fail one, otherwise the plane might just go in circles. So that's not something you'll really commonly see. I get DC-3s, uh, tail drag or big radial engines you might find has a, a minimum controllable ground speed. Um, but for our purposes, VMC, we're specifically relating to VMC uh, airborne, VMCA. Anyway, so we're talking about uh, if you get too slow, even with two engines, that's not a good idea, just in case an engine failure does take place. So it says, due to the inherent risks of operating at or close to VMCA with asymmetric thrust and the desire to simulate and practice these maneuvers, uh, in pilot training and certification, VSSE may be defined as the single engine uh, safe speed, SSE, single engine safe speed. VSSE safe single engine speed, that's a lot of S's, is the minimum speed to intentionally render the critical engine inoperative 
established and designated by the manufacturer as the safe intentional one engine in operative speed. This speed is selected to reduce uh, the accident potential from loss of control due to simulated engine failures at inordinately slow airspeed. In practice, we're going to make sure we do not go below at least uh, 105 uh, because that's our single engine climb speed. Now, if you have, let's say we're in cruise flight and we have an engine failure, normally when we're in cruise flight, this aircraft cruises around 140 to 160 miles per hour. If I suddenly bring a throttle to idle, and when we do these engine failure scenarios, that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to bring the throttle to idle uh, and then have you work it out. Uh, when we have a single engine failure, the aircraft does decelerate. It's going to start slowing down 160, 150, 140, 130. Um, and it will eventually get to around 110, 100 miles per hour. But it takes, I want to say, 30 seconds at least. Like, there's no rush. Really, I mean, you want to do this in a prompt recovery, but there's no urgency like, oh, my God, if I do do this right away, I'm going to crash. Like it's, It slows down and eventually you'll need to deal with it. Uh, generally speaking, we in practice, we don't want to go less than 105 because there's no need for it. I mean, even if I fail your engine in single engine flight or if I fail your engine in cruise flight, the plane will slow down. But once you do your drill, it'll bring it back up. And the slowest you'll get in that exercise would be like 110 miles per hour then when you clean things up and you retract your, your flaps, retract your gear and you feather the failed engine, the plane will stabilize at a speed around 130. So we don't really get that slow when we're doing an engine failure in cruise flight. When we do the engine failure in the overshoot, uh, you do your approach, basically your simulated approach at 110 miles per hour. When you initiate that climb, I'm gonna fail an engine on you and you wanna aim for 105 miles per hour. So I would say don't go any lower than 105 because you're gonna reduce your, your heading control ability because of the lack of uh, aerodynamic effect on the rudder. But um, you know, according to the POH, you can go as low as 90, but please don't. It's just, there's no need for us to ever go to that, that low with uh, single engine operating. So this is from the POH itself. It says, uh, under no circumstances should an attempt be made to fly at a speed below this uh, VMC uh, with only one engine operating as a safety precaution uh, when operating under single engine flight conditions either in training or emergency situations, maintain an indicated airspeed uh, above 90 miles per hour. So that's what the POH says, but again, in practice, we use much higher. Uh, so minimum controllable airspeed is the calibrated airspeed at which when the critical engine is suddenly made in inoperative, it is possible to maintain control of the airplane, airplane with the engine still inoperative and maintain straight flight with the same speed with this angle of bank, not more than five degrees. So saying, this is as, as slow as you can get and still keep this plane under control and keep, still keep it at a constant altitude, constant heading. Uh, actually, sorry, I take back what I said about altitude. It doesn't guarantee altitude. It gets, just guarantees that you'll be able to maintain heading. There will be some situations where if you have an engine failure, you can't maintain altitude. So you have to do what's called a drift down where you just naturally maintain your airspeed and just accept the altitude loss. Um, as an airspeed, as airspeed decreases, the rudder becomes less effective. Eventually an airspeed will be reached where full rudder deflection will be required to maintain directional control. This airspeed is VMC. Any further reduction in airspeed will result in loss of directional control. Oh, can I edit? I wanna, you can see there's a video here from YouTube. Um, and I wanna be able to use, I wanna, here's what I'll do. I'll close, I'll minimize that. And I'll copy this into the comments of the chat so that you can play that at your leisure. And uh, it's, it's a good video, so I recommend uh, taking a look at it. Uh, and coming back to that example I gave about the guy when they were doing the recovery from maneuvering at reduced airspeed and when he, he accidentally brought one throttle up. So be very careful with that because you know, we're going to be doing recoveries from slow speed maneuvers where we will be you know, stalling the aircraft. So when we do these stalls, Bring the powers up evenly and deliberately, but don't don't jam them. Don't go too fast, and don't all the way to the top. Right, you just bring it enough, bring it up enough to produce the power that you need. Uh, factors which affect the MC. Now, this is a question that our examiner might ask in the groundwork. He likes to ask them, "What would you do? And what if I had the gear down? Does that help me for my VMC? Does that work against me for my VMC? Like, how is that going to affect my minimum controllable airspeed?" So, let's talk in detail about how different configurations of the aircraft might affect your minimum controllable airspeed. So the first one is the obvious one, it's a critical engine, right? We said earlier that if my left engine is the one that dies, that puts me in the more disadvantaged state. And so I don't want that to happen. So if I, now, and here's the other thing too, when, we're, when they produce a, a speed in the POH, they say, 
the POH says your minimum control of airspeed is 80 miles per hour. And for us, again, for our aircraft, it's actually 72. But that number is based on the most adverse conditions. So that's saying that you've had a failure of your critical engine. The aircraft is configured in the worst possible state. The, the altitude and the uh, density of the air is the worst possible state. So it's saying this is the, the highest this number is going to be. That 72 is the worst case scenario. Uh, if you have anything that's not as bad, then your speed might actually be a little bit lower than that. So let's talk more detail. So a critical engine, do you even have one? The answer is for a Piper Seneca, no, you don't. So don't even worry about this one. But if it's your critical engine that fails, then that's going to be bad. If it's your non-critical engine that fails, then okay, maybe my VMC will be a little bit lower than published. Uh, thrust and power. So if I have, uh, well, first of all, it says higher power setting on the operative engine will increase VMC. And that makes sense because if I got full power on the one remaining engine, that's producing a very strong yawing tendency. So I need to use a lot of rudder to uh, stop that, which means I need to have a higher airspeed to control for it. If, however, I've got that engine at idle and it's not producing really any thrust, then I don't need as much rudder. And therefore, you know, I, I can slow down more before I kind of, before that, that adverse yaw becomes an issue. So if I'm at a high power setting, like in an overshoot, that's going to be one that's really bad for um, VMC conditions. But if I'm in cruise flight and I've only got kind of a partial power, like if I'm in cruise power setting, then that's not nearly as bad. So uh, the highest likelihood of having uh, a bad VMC will be on takeoff uh, or an engine out drilling, like in an overshoot. Uh, the landing gear. Now, the landing gear is actually a funny one because uh, the landing gear actually helps us. If I have the gear down, uh, it will act like a keel, like a, uh, the keel of a boat to give me more stability. And so that extra stability actually reduces my VMC. So gear down is good. Um, other things, flaps. Now, flaps is a good one too. So we say extended flaps will increase both drag and lift. And because the flaps are extended, so let's imagine I've had a failed engine and I've got the remaining engine producing a lot of thrust. So that's producing a lot of yaw in the direction of the failed engine. However, if the flaps have been deployed on that side, it's producing drag in the opposite direction. So thrust going forward, but drag pulling back. So they work against each other. So then I would say that the flaps deployed actually makes it a little bit easier for me to control. If the flaps were at zero, then I've got no drag on that side. So it's just an un uninterrupted yaw pushing me over. So extended flaps will increase both drag and lift. The increased drag from the extended flap behind the operating engine may tend to oppose the yawing motion of that engine requiring less rudder to counteract yaw. In addition, flap extension tends to raise the tail farther into the relative airflow, increasing rudder effectiveness. So that's another bonus that we get for it. So having the flaps extended is good. It reduces my VMC. Weight. Uh, VMC is not affected by weight in straight and level flight. However, uh, in a bank, it will be. So when the aircraft is in a banked attitude, which you will be with a failed engine because you have to raise the dead, you roll into the good engine, a component of the aircraft weight acts along the horizontal component of lift to create a more effective side slip towards the operating engine. So for a given bank, the heavier the plane, the lower the aircraft's VMC. And to put that in simple terms, and unfortunately I don't have a graphic to kind of show how that works, but you guys can Google this if you're curious. But the idea that if you are in a banked attitude, with a failed engine is that you are more coordinated. And as a consequence, this will actually decrease your minimum control of airspeed. By being more coordinated, it makes it uh, easier for your rudder to keep the plane going straight, or at least keep the aircraft coordinated. And it gives the rudder more, more leeway to do other things like uh, control for yaw. So yeah, heavy plane is good. Uh, center of gravity, that's probably the easiest one to visualize. So we say, um, Minimum controllable airspeed is greatest when the center of gravity is at the most aft position. And the way to think about center of gravity is that if this is my plane and my rudder is back here, that my rudder is effective because it's causing my plane to pivot around my center of gravity. So if I have one engine producing a lot of yaw in a certain, actually, let me try to, you know, I got to do it like this, producing a lot of yaw to the left, let's say, then I want to have a very forward center of gravity because that rudder will have more leverage, will have a greater arm to stop that yaw. So it's got more distance, more leverage. It's like having, uh, it's the difference between having a rudder really close and really far. But we're not moving the rudder, we're moving the center of gravity instead. If I have an aft center of gravity, the distance between the rudder and that center of gravity will be small. My rudder will have reduced authority, and so it will have less of an ability to counteract the yaw 
when an engine failure takes place. So forward center of gravity good, aft center of gravity bad. And the nice thing about that is that that's true even in single engine aircraft, forward center of gravity good in single engine aircraft, better stall characteristics, aft center of gravity bad, that, that's where the plane wants to stall. We don't, we don't want that to happen. So center of gravity being forward is, is actually to our benefit. And then the uh, aircraft feather. It's kind of the same idea as saying that if the, the operating engine, if it's producing a lot of thrust is bad. If my failed engine is producing a lot of drag, it's also bad. So depending on whether I have failed that engine or not, uh, will determine what my VMC is. So the worst condition, like if I uh, bring all these conditions together, I say, what is the worst condition for VMC? So I'd say, I have a failure of the critical engine. The left engine has failed. The remaining engine is at a high power setting. My gear is up. My flaps are up. My plane is light. My center of gravity is aft. And my failed engine has not been feathered. So if you put all those conditions together, that's like the worst case scenario. And that's what the uh, opera, the engineers and the designers of the aircraft are looking at saying in the worst case scenario, what would your VMC, your minimum controllable airspeed be? And that's what they publish. Now, if you have anything other than that, like if you get in a situation where you say, it's my non-critical engine that's failed, or I don't even have a critical engine, uh, like an our aircraft has failed. I have a low power setting. My gear is down. My flaps are down. My aircraft is heavy. I have a forward center gravity and my failed engine has been feathered your actual VMC might be quite a bit lower than, your, um, than the one published. So that's nice to know. Now, the last uh, condition for VMC is air density. And uh, it basically has to do with the idea that, uh, well, it says for non-supercharged or turbocharged engines that in dense air, uh, the thrust of that engine, the one remaining engine can produce is, um, is worse for me. So we say in air that is dense, so your low altitude, low temperature, and high pressure, um, that remaining engine is going to produce a lot of thrust and it's going to make my VMC higher. So that's what I was trying to say here. So then the, the last condition that we say when the engineers and designers come up with the, what is your VMC for this aircraft? They use the conditions. They say you're at sea level, uh, on a, I think it's a standard day. Um, yeah, they use the altitude at sea level, but I think they still have to use standard atmospheric conditions, 15 degrees Celsius and two nine. 29.92 inches of mercury, if memory serves. I might be wrong on that. Um, yeah, so I'll just kind of read through here. So it says VMC is defined using a very specific set of conditions. Uh, the published VMC and actual VMC can be two entirely different things. VMC only addresses directional control is not related to aircraft performance. Does not guarantee you'll be able to maintain altitude. That's a whole different thing. Uh, while controllability is important, single engine performance is just as important. You must be able to balance both controllability and performance to keep uh, a serious situation from getting out of control. In some cases, an element that provides an increase in controllability can actually hurt performance. Do not attempt to maintain altitude at VMC. Um, pilots have died trying to do this, except that a descent is necessary and act accordingly. And there was actually a crash happened uh, at the Spring Bank. Flight Training Center, as I'm not sure, actually, I might have mis said the name, but out in Calgary Springbank, there was a flight school there, a, a friend of mine, actually, he worked at, and a student of his, an instructor he knew, like, he was a former student because he went on to the multi-training. Anyways, they had a Piper Seneca as well, and they crashed on takeoff because I think they were actually, we, there's no cockpit voice recorder, no flight data recorder on these aircraft, so we don't know for sure what actually took place there, but an engine failure of some kind happened, whether it was a true engine failure or whether they were simulating it for training purposes, we don't know. But uh, they experienced some kind of degradation of performance on takeoff, low to the ground. And the problem with uh, that is that Springbank is, is actually the highest airport uh, above sea level in Canada. It's about 4,000 feet above sea level. So I think it was a spring day. So it's not super warm, but you know, you're 4,000 feet above sea level, you're plus temperatures, your air density is going to be fairly low. You're simulating engine failure or doing an actual engine failure uh, close to the ground. And eventually what basically happened was they were, they, they got themselves too slow. They um, traded airspeed for altitude. They just did their best to keep their, themselves in the air. Eventually they hit VMC, VMC and the plane rolled over and they just didn't have the altitude to recover. Unlike that example I gave earlier where I said the, they were coming back from the practice area and they were 3000 feet above ground. And even with 3000 feet, they barely pulled out of the bottom of that dive. In uh, Springbank, they just had nowhere to go. They were upside down and that was it, both killed instantly. 
So this is why we don't practice um, engine failure stuff on takeoff. We take it very seriously. We make sure we're at a safe altitude before we do any of these maneuvers. Now that's not to say that um, what they did was, uh, they did get the plane too slow. They could have worked themselves out of that situation. Even if that plane could, couldn't have maintained altitude, if they had just held 105 miles per hour, yeah, they would have crash landed at the end of the runway, but at least they would have crash landed on the landing gear. Right? They would have, they would have been upright. And yeah, that would have been unfortunate. They would have torn off the gear. They would have destroyed the engines. They might have come to a, a screeching halt and you know put a, a bit of a you know a divot in the ground, but at least it wasn't a crater, right? They if and I don't want to fault these guys because I wasn't there and I don't know what happened, but we'd be very, very careful with this stuff. You when it comes to the comment here saying about controllability and performance. Control has to be paramount. I'd, I'd easily sacrifice altitude to keep that airspeed because the moment you lose that airspeed, you're upside down and you've lost everything. So be careful. So when uh, the engineers are talking about VMC, these are the things we're looking at. We use the acronym COMBAT to, to, to remember, like what is those, those uh, is it seven, the seven conditions to remember what, what they're looking at when they're uh, considering VMC. So here's what it is. C stands for critical engine. O stands for operating engine at maximum power. M stands for maximum weight. B stands for bank angle, no more than five degrees. A stands for aft center gravity. T stands for takeoff configuration, which is gear up and flaps up. Uh, and we will, and that's nice to note too, on takeoff, we don't use flaps on this aircraft. It's always flap zero on takeoff. There is a procedure in the uh, POH for a short field effort is what they call it, a short field takeoff, where I believe you use flap 25 for takeoff and you rotate at something like 70 miles per hour. And I have to look at the POH to make sure. But uh, we don't do that in practice in the S aircraft. We aren't going to train it. Uh, so don't worry about it. But we do on landing, we use uh, flaps 40. Uh, generally speaking, unless we're dealing with icing conditions or strong crosswinds or even single engine approach, in which case we may use a reduced flap setting of flaps 25, but I'll come to that later in this lesson. But yeah, gear up, flaps up, and standard temperature. So it was standard. Yes, 15 degrees Celsius, 29.92 inches of mercury. So that's the worst case scenario. So they put all those conditions. They say, what is our VMC? under this context, and that's what they put in the book. Again, in our aircraft, because I believe we have the vortex generators on the wings, and just by the by, we have 10 on each, just 10 little vortex generators on each wing, so a total of 20. Um, because we have that, it lets us make our VMC, our minimum controllable airspeed is 72 miles per hour. Um, now, what happens when we get to VMC? What's this gonna, what is it gonna look like? Well, if you look at that video that I uh, copied into the comments, it does a pretty good job, I think, of showing kind of what happens and how to fix it. But, uh, there are warning signs that a VMC is occurring and about to occur. This includes loss of directional control. And that's going to be the first one. So if I'm if I'm at full rudder and the plane is still going off one side or the other, that's a bad sign. That tells me I need to fix something right away. The rudder pedal is depressed to its fullest travel and the airplane is still yawing or rolling to the inoperative engine. Not good. Uh, stall warning horn or buffeting of the controls. A single engine stall is very dangerous and could result in a spin. Light twins are not known for good stall and spin recovery. Don't spin a twin. That's, that's not a, the altitude loss is going to be dramatic. Um, and depending on what your stall speed and your VMC is, uh, you might find that in certain aircraft, your VMC speed might be a stalled condition. And uh, this was true, I used to fly the Piper Seminole and it was, you couldn't put yourself in VMC without stalling first. And this was a good thing because it gives you an extra layer of warning before it happens. He's saying, uh, if I start hearing the stall warning horn, you go, oh shoot, that tells me I'm getting close, not just to the stall, but the VMC so that I want to recover. In aircraft where the uh, minimum controllable airspeed is higher than the stall, you won't get that added warning of the stall warning. However, uh, it's easier to recover from because all you need to do is lower the nose and then get the, um, uh, and reduce the power on the failed engine. So you're not stalled yet. So you'll still have aerodynamic authority of that aircraft. Uh, other thing, a rapid decay of control effectiveness. This could lead to uh, loss of control of the aircraft. The big one predominantly for the giveaway about uh, VMC, approaching VMC is the loss of directional control. And it doesn't even mean that you're getting, uh, like you could have loss of directional control way before VMC. And I've seen this a lot of times when we're dealing with uh, students when they're doing engine failures in the overshoot. And just briefly talking about that procedure, what we do is we, we start at 5,000 feet, we slow the plane down. And as we slow down, we hit our speed targets below 140, gear down, below 125, flaps to 40. We're going to fully deploy the flaps. At 110 miles per hour, we're going to pitch the aircraft over. We're going to set up a gentle descent of around 600 feet per minute or so, kind of what we normally would do on approach. 
And then when we get to our desired minimums, whatever they happen to be, and it might be different from day to day, depending on the context. But when we get to minimums, this is the point where you're going to do the, uh, the overshoots. So you're going to do first power to as much as you need to not overboost the engine. Power first, bring the nose up. We're going to go flaps first and then gear, right? Because I'm going to overspeed potentially the flaps before the gear. If I go flaps up, gear up. And then at this point, this is where I come in and I simulate an engine failure by bringing one of your throttles back. So when that happens, you have to kick the rudder and keep the plane going straight. And what you'll have to do, because it's an overshoot, you pitch for your single engine best rate of climb speed, 105. Now, if you're at 105 to 110, that's probably the sweet spot. Now, and you'll find that with the single engine overshoot, you pretty much got to be bang on. 105, exactly. If you're 107 or 103, your climb performance might be zero. Like it, you have to be bang on with that airspeed. But on the plus side is always better. But what I'll often find, this is a common mistake that students will make when they're doing the training for this, is that if you're a little bit on the slow side, if you're more focused on the drill than flying the plane, if you get to like 100 miles per hour, you've just compromised a little bit of uh, rudder authority and the plane will start to drift. And it's only going to be small, but it starts to come off to the side. And then once they get the nose down and the speed comes back, they get control and they can steer the plane back. But that's a common thing that I end up seeing. So be careful of that airspeed. So if you're having problems maintaining heading on an engine failure in the overshoot or just even a normal engine failure, what's your airspeed? That's the, that's the first clue and the first thing that I'm going to look at to see. Maybe that's the first thing we can fix to give you better heading control in this maneuver. Uh, so recovering from VMC, here's what you need to do. Uh, reduce the power on the operating engine. Get rid of the problem first. That the engine that's producing the thrust is the problem child. Chop that to idle immediately. So both engines throttle all the way back and then pitch the nose down. Lowering the nose of the aircraft will get that air flowing over the uh, control surface again, particularly the tail, giving you control. So you might have a situation where you've you started to roll. You go, oh, no, 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 power idle. And now lower that nose. Okay, now I'm flying. Okay, I'm in a banked attitude. That's not great. So I'll roll it back. And now that I'm flying, okay, I've got a nose down attitude. I'm losing power. Okay, I can start to bring the power up again and recover myself. But yeah, if you start to see the start to go like that, idle, nose down, and then bring yourself out of it slowly. And if you did have an engine failure, let's say that's why you were rolling and you can't bring both engines up, well, it's still okay. Just get yourself to a safe airspeed of at least 105, and then you can bump up the power and bring your power back again. As long as you protect your airspeed, you'll still be able to um, you know, fly straight. You might not be able to maintain altitude, but at least you'll be able to keep that, that heading under control. And that's gonna be the most important thing. So what is the difference between a VMC and a stall? I already kind of mentioned saying that different aircraft, you might see the VMC speed is either above or below the speed. So we say normally aspirated engines or um, say piston aircraft that aren't super or, super or, turbo, super or turbo charged, uh, lose efficiency as density altitude increases, which means as you climb, the throttles just start to lose power. Uh, even our aircraft that's turbocharged, you will need to find that you increase the throttle levers as you climb. The, the manifold pressure starts to drop off as you gain altitude. That's just because of decreasing uh, ambient pressure. Since the operating engine is not producing as much thrust as at sea level, asymmetric airflow will be reduced, which will lower VMC. And this is what we talk about the, the air density. Oh, and by the way, you see Piper behind me? That's my cat. Her name is Piper and appropriately named. So uh, she's only about nine months old right now. Uh, anyways, um, so yeah, as air density decreases, so does your VMC. Uh, we must remember though that uh, stall speed is an indicated airspeed and will remain constant as altitude increases or decreases. Eventually the speeds will meet at some point. So what I'm gonna show you in the next slide, I believe it is uh, right here. The vertical line here is your stall speed. That doesn't change with altitude because that's an indicated speed. Your VMC, because of the change in pressure, it's gonna change with altitude, is going to be uh, changing as you go. Now, in this particular example, uh, we're assuming that the minimum controllable airspeed was above stall uh, at, at low altitudes and then below stall at above, uh, below stall speed at high altitudes. So we're just talking about the difference here, what's going to happen. So if you're at low altitude, and your VMC is above the stall, well, then again, your first indication of approaching the stall will actually be the yaw, because it means that you're uh, in a single engine context, at least. Uh, if you're single engine and you're approaching the stall, it's going to be the yaw that happens first. In the higher altitudes, it's going to be the, ball, the stall warning horn, but specifically the buffet that happens before the, the yaw. So advantages and disadvantages to both. If I'm at the high altitudes, that's kind of the nice one, because it gives me the warning. The stall warning says, hey, not only are you getting too slow, but you're also getting close to your minimum controllable airspeed. So that's nice. But in this one, it's easier to recover because 
I'll have enough airspeed still flowing over the wings that in the worst case scenario, if I got myself into a VMC roll, I'm not stalled. So I, I just bring the power down and lower the nose a little bit and it should be easier to get myself out of that. So um, just it, it, no matter what the situation you find yourself in, whether it's a, uh, um, a stall or a, I should say in, in a VMC roll situation, you're still gonna do the same no matter what. You're gonna bring your power to idle, lower the nose. And once you have a safe airspeed, then you're gonna power your way out of it. Uh, engine inoperative effects. So if you lose an engine in a twin aircraft, uh, that doesn't just mean you lose, uh, well, I say you lose 50% of your engine power because obviously you, you lost one engine, but that does mean that you're actually going to lose up to 80% of your excess thrust. So your climb performance will be seriously degraded. If you actually look at the performance charts on the POH, your two engine uh, climb performance might be around, I want to say anywhere between like 1300 to 1500 feet per minute with both engines operating. If you lose an engine, <clears throat> your climb performance might be all the way down to like a hundred or 200 feet per minute. And that's no exaggeration. I mean, there are days where this, this these planes can be dogs and even at like 5,000 feet ASL, you just can't maintain an altitude. So, you know, it's a significant detriment in performance. The remaining engine then creates asymmetric thrust, negatively affecting directional control, which you must counteract. To avoid losing directional control, hold your best rate of climb speed at a minimum. So 105, again, there, there is the, I'll come in the comments here, our single engine, not like that, single engine safe speed, which we said was 90. That's what the POH says. You can go that slow, uh, but in practice, we're not. We're going to use this speed instead, 105. Please don't go any lower than that. Um, to avoid losing directional control as well, be in a zero side slip condition. And actually, that's the next slide. We'll talk about what a zero side slip condition is. And uh, do this even if it causes a descent because uh, heading control is paramount. I'd sacrifice altitude 10 times out of 10. But let's talk about what a zero side slip condition is. Oh, I'm tapping on the wrong thing. Zero side slip. So if you have an engine failure, there's going to be a lot of yaw that takes place. And this yaw um, is going to be a little bit different from what you'd experience in a single engine. If you're in a single engine and you want to control for yaw, we say we step on the ball. We, we step on the rudder and it moves the ball back to the middle of the inclinometer or the, the gauge on the turn coordinator that, that shows you're in the middle. If it's in the middle, then you say you're in coordinated flight. However, in a multi-engine aircraft with a failure of an engine, putting the ball to center does not actually make you coordinated. It actually makes you uncoordinated. So to be in coordinated flight in a multi-engine aircraft, the ball is actually going to be halfway out. It's going to be halfway displaced and it's going to be actually bisected by one of the lines on the inclinometer. So let's read the comments here. So it says, by keeping the ball centered with an engine failure, you're actually in a side slip and therefore in uncoordinated flight. Instead, be in a zero side slip condition by using rudder to split the ball in half, which maximizes your performance and directional control. In addition, when the aircraft is banked three to five degrees toward the operating engine, or we say we raise the dead, the dihedral of the wing will create a horizontal lift component, which will pull you basically into coordinated flight. This will minimize the rudder deflection required to align the longitudinal axis of the airplane to the relative wind. With this bank, the appropriate amount of rudder deflection will be indicated by the inc on the inclinometer by the ball being halfway deflected toward the operating engine. So putting this all into simple terms here, if you have an engine failure, three to five degree bank angle in straight and level flight, step on the ball to split the ball. And then we're in a zero side slip condition. And that's the most coordinated flight. That's going to be the easiest way to fly the plane. If you put too much rudder and you bring that ball back to center, the plane's going to start yawing in that direction. If you don't put enough, it's going to start yawing in the other direction. Um, and what you'll find is that in cruise flight, when we experience engine failures in cruise, so we just got like a normal cruise power setting and I kill an engine on you. And I, we don't actually fail the engines. I don't bring the mixture to cut off. We're not doing anything like that. I just bring it to idle. And then you get a feel for how the plane performs. But when I do that, uh, you're going to need to use a, a, a bit of rudder. It's not, it's not going to be a ton. It'd be, you might have a sore thigh afterwards if I make you do it for a long time. Um, you can skip leg day at the gym later on if that's the case. But it's, it's manageable. And we do have a rudder trim on this aircraft as well. So there's a little uh, wheel near the pitch trim that you can use to release the pressure. Uh, if you're doing an engine failure in the overshoot, you're gonna need a lot of rudder. I mean, you, you, you may or may not have that, that rudder to the floor because 
you're trying to fight a full power setting on the good engine, trying to climb you back up to altitude. So you'll need a lot of rudder. The thing I will say about the rudder wheel uh, to caution you is that you don't want to overdo it. And the common mistake that people make is that they think, oh, I'm single engine, I'll just trim it out, which is good, right? Because if you're coming in for landing and you're single engine, yeah, you want to release the pressure and make it easy on your leg. However, you have to be careful because on landing, when you bring that throttle to idle, you've taken away that thrust and now the rudder is unnecessarily trimmed. And what's going to hey, stop that? And what's going to happen is that you become uncoordinated in the flare. So what I would recommend is that if you're coming in for a single engine landing, trim it out as you need to when you come in. As you're descending, you're reducing the power. So the amount of uh, rudder trim that you need will actually be less. So you can actually bring the aircraft back to neutral trim. And then um, you just use the rudder that you need on the approach and flare because you don't want to be in a situation where you bring the throttle idle and suddenly have to kick the rudders to keep it straight. Um, that could be fairly dangerous. So and give Piper a few scratches here while we're talking. Uh, and no bite. Anyways, uh, down you go. Um, yeah, so continuing on here. So now let's talk about how do we actually deal with an engine failure? Uh, this is going to be a memory item. You can't pull a checklist for this because it's so important. You need to do it on reflex. It needs to be just automatic. So what I recommend, you know, I'm going to demonstrate these for you the first couple of times. Like when we do this in the practice area, I'm not just going to say, here we go. Here's an engine failure. Like I'm going to show you how it's done the first time and I'll do the whole drill. But uh, really, I would recommend that you do some chair flying to practice this just to like close your eyes. OK, here's what I do and go through the, the process because it does need to be automatic. And that's just even for the first couple of lessons. After that, you know, doing the, the drill is the easy part, flying the plane at the same time, and then doing things like turns and maneuvering, and then IFR approaches. If you're going to go for your IFR rating, doing all of this under the hood, following an approach plate, this is where you make your money. So you should have this down pat fairly early in your training and really work hard at this. Um, so here's the drill. And now, first of all, I'll, I'll put the caveat by saying that uh, control of the aircraft is still paramount. A lot of students, what they do, they get so busy doing the procedure that they forget to fly the plane and the plane just starts, you know, doing all this. Uh, and like I said before, if you get the plane too slow and you get on the backside, like slower than 105, that's where heading starts to get away from you. It just makes it more challenging. So what I recommend is control the plane first, take a deep breath. I mean, there's no, and I, I one of the things, if you, if you guys work with me for this, these lessons, I'll show you that when I fail the engine, I tell you, you got 30 seconds before you really have to start like applying the power to protect your airspeed. I mean, for the first 30 seconds, yeah, the speed's bleeding off, but you should be in a safe configuration, at least in cruise flight, before you really have to start to panic and run your drill. But fly the plane first, get it all set up the way you need, you know, put the rudder in, put the bank angle. Okay, I'm feeling good. And now go, okay, do my drill as it comes across. Um, that's in cruise flight in, in an overshoot. Okay. You got to be a little bit more on the ball to pardon the pun. Um, but let's talk about the procedure. So maintain directional control. Number one, step on the ball, but not to center, right? Zero side slip condition, put that ball, uh, half halfway out, now split the ball, a little bit of bank in the direction of the good engine mixtures, props, and throttles. And for those of you that are just getting introduced to the idea of having an aircraft that has a variable pitch propeller where you actually can manually control the RPM. I've got a slide further on here. We talk about how we measure these things and how it's different from a single engine. But um, generally speaking, when I'm dealing with my throttle quadrant, I've got mixtures here, propellers here, throttles here. And I'm, I'm doing, it looks backwards on the camera, but I'm doing it from my perspective as the pilot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my mixtures full rich. I'm going to be, bring my propellers to max RPM, basically to reduce the load or the torque on the engines. And I'm gonna bring my throttles to the full. And generally speaking, what we say when it comes to propellers and, and throttles, we say we keep the props in front. So if you're ever going to increase power, you always increase the, the props first, because if I suddenly jam the throttle and the propellers are at a coarse setting, then I'm producing a lot of load on that. I suddenly make the engine go really fast and that produces a lot of load on a propeller blade that might have a slight angle to the relative wind flow, and that could damage the engine. So we say we put the props forward first, we keep the props in front. Or another way of saying that is I just work right to left. I go mixture first, propeller second, throttles third. I go one, two, three in a row when I'm trying to increase my power. If I want to decrease my power, I still keep the props in front. What I do is I would, if I want to slow down, I bring my throttles back first, and then I bring my propellers. But the propellers always uh, stay ahead at all times. So maintain directional control, 
mixture full rich, propellers max, throttles full. That's my, uh, we say actually with the engine out drill, we say control power drag. So first of all, control power. I went boom, 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 one, two, three, everything to max. And now I need to clean up the drag of the aircraft. Whether I go gear first or flaps first, depends on the aircraft, depends on the POH. We say in our plane, we hit the speed limit for flaps first. So we go flaps up, then gear up. If you're in cruise flight, still touch to make sure. I mean, in cruise flight, the gear and flaps will already be up, but just as a good habit to get into, you go, you touch it, you make sure they're where they need to be. Uh, and then we say, identify the failed engine. So we'd say, okay, how do I identify which engines failed? Well, which rudder am I applying? So if I have a failed right engine, let's say, then what I'm doing is I need to put a lot of left rudder to keep that plane going straight because the left engine is still working and it's trying to push me over. So I need a lot of left rudder to stop that from happening. My right rudder isn't doing anything, or sorry, my right, well, my right rudder isn't being used. My right foot could possibly be on the floor doing nothing. So we say dead foot, dead engine. So if my right foot is dead, my right engine is dead. So remember, I, that's how I've identified, but I want to confirm that because there have been accidents in the past where people have accidentally shut down the wrong engine. There was one in Indonesia, it was an ATR, I think an ATR 72 a couple of years ago. They were on takeoff, they had a failure of one engine, they shut down the other one, and then they just crashed into a, a highway and a, a river at the end of the runway basically. And it was caught on dash cam. If you guys Google it, I forget the name of the crash uh, flight number, but it's quite a dramatic crash, killed a lot of people. But yeah, we, we wanna make sure that we were shutting down the correct engine. So the way that I verify that my suspicions are correct, that the engine I think is dead actually is dead, is I'm going to take the throttle lever and bring it to idle. Now, if it's my right engine that's failed and I bring the right throttle to idle, then I should see no adverse yaw. There should be no change in the performance of the aircraft. If on the other hand, I got that wrong and I start bringing the throttle back and all of a sudden the plane starts doing this. Okay, well, that's my indication that that was producing power for me. So maybe I need to bring that back and think about the other one and look at what I'm doing because some I made a mistake somewhere along the line here that needs to be corrected. So we say, uh, yeah, identify dead foot, dead engine, verify with throttle response. When we do this in practice, in the practice area for real, like we're going to do some stuff in the simulator, but in, in practice, I'm going to already have the throttle at idle. So when you verify, you just touch it. So yeah, it's already at idle, no adverse yaw, and then continue on. And um, then it says troubleshoot a feather. And troubleshoot specifically means cause check restart. And what you're going to do is you're basically going to work from left to right across the cockpit and just make sure everything's where it should be. And specifically, I'm thinking like spark, fuel, and air. So I'm saying, uh, oh, is my, are my magnetos on? Is my master on? My temperatures and pressures on my gauges look good. What's my oil temperature and pressure looking at? Did I lose oil pressure in an engine? Is my mixture full rich? My alternate air, I need to check if, if that would have the situation. My fuel select valve should be in the on position. So I check these things to make sure they're all where they should be. And if they, if they are, then I'll attempt a restart. Now in real life, I would do a real restart if everything is where it should be. Um, in training, you just ask me, was the restart successful? I'll say, nah, probably wasn't. Maybe I'll say, yeah, if you did a really good cause check restart, say, yeah, it was good. Yeah, we, you got your engine back now. Let's bring it back to cruise flight and pr practice again, but at least check. Um, and that's what we'll do in training. Now, in, in the flight test, you can ask the examiner, did it restart? He's always going to tell you no. So you just say, okay, I tried the restart. It didn't, didn't work. So now I'm going to feather the engine. And basically feathering an engine, and that's what you can see in the picture here, is that when you turn the propeller flush, or I'd say, parallel to the airflow so that it's not producing any drag anymore. Um, and that's just the way to clean up the aircraft, make it a little bit easier to control. And the way to feather the aircraft, different aircraft have different procedures. And our aircraft specifically though, it's throttle to idle, propeller to feather detent, mixture to idle cutoff. And what you'll notice is that, I wish I, you know, if you were here in person, I'd be able to draw this out and show you in person, but, and I'll demonstrate this in the lesson anyways, but when you're increasing power, it goes from right to left. I go mixture full rich, propellers to max, throttles to full. When I want to feather an engine, I'm working from left to right, bringing things down. I'm gonna go throttle to idle, propeller to feather, mixture to idle cutoff. So that's how I do those drills. Um, so to kind of bring it all back together, if I'm in cruise flight, and I've had an engine failure. Let's control the plane first. Step on the rudder. Let's, uh, split the ball. Bank three to five degrees in the direction of the good engine. Breath. Okay, I got this. Plane's under control. Mixture full rich. Propellers to max. Throttles to full. Flaps up. Gear up. Identify dead foot, dead engine. Verify with throttle response to idle. If there's no adverse yaw, I got it right. Cost check restart. Left to right, making sure everything's where it should be. 
Magneto's on, master on, temperatures and pressures, mixture full rich, alternate air check, fuel select valve on, restart, was it successful? No, it wasn't. Feather, propeller to either throttle to idle, propeller to feather, mixture to idle cutoff. So that's the full drill. That's a lot of stuff, right? And that's the memory item. That's what you have to have memorized and it needs to be automatic. And doing that while you're flying a plane and later on, like I said, flying an approach and doing turns and stuff like that is not an easy task. So something to work towards. That's going to be the ultimate goal. Once this exercise is complete, then you need to say, okay, then I would look for the checklist, make sure that I got all the items complete. And then um, I would advise ATC to have a major issue. So squawk 7700 and do my uh, my pan pan call. I might have to address my cat here in a second, but I'll keep the video going. So at least, at least be entertaining purposes for you guys. Oh, and I just noticed here in the comments here, Trans Asia Airways flight 235. Um, do I, can I put that in the, the link here? Yeah, so I'll copy, can I copy that? Uh, Command C. Yeah, I think that worked. So now you can you can click on the video and uh, take a look and uh, um, watch the video later. And it's just, it's just a it's just a crash basically is all this. Uh, now the question becomes: Should you restart a feather? Now I gave you the, the example that we were in cruise flight and you wanted to shut the engine down because it, what the restart was unsuccessful. The one thing I'll tell you that is if there the only time that you wouldn't really want to do a restart is if you've had either an engine fire or any kind of excuse me, a mechanical issue that would preclude, preclude a restart, something like a loss of oil pressure. So if I saw a low oil temperature, high oil pressure, and it was going out of limits. And this uh, question that sometimes Tom likes to ask our examiner here is that if, uh, if your temperature is high and your pressure is low, what would you do? And the answer is if, if it's just a little bit high and a little bit low, I'm not gonna panic yet, but I'll keep an eye on things. But if it starts to go out of limits, then I gotta deal with the situation. But if it's indicating some kind of, mechanical issue with the aircraft, I'm not going to restart it. And is, that's just foolish. I would just make the situation worse. Uh, so we wouldn't do a restart in that situation. If there's a fire though, and, and every air, aircraft has a little bit different procedure on how to deal with a fire. But the, the basic premise for a fire is that if I have an engine fire, um, what I want to do is I want to pinch off the gas from the fire because obviously the gas fuel would feed that fire. If I have, um, I've got basically two cutoff points for the fuel. I've got the mixed idle cutoff, which cuts it off just before it goes into the cylinders, because this, this is a fuel injected aircraft. So if I go mixed idle cutoff, it cuts it off into the cylinders, but that fuel line leading all the way back to the fuel tank might still be full of gas. So then I don't want to have the fire jump that, chase the fuel line all the way up to the tank and go boom, like make a bigger problem. It wouldn't go boom, but you know, it's, it's the risk of an expanding fire could be a concern. But the fuel select valve, when I turn that off, it pinches off the fuel at the tank basically. So that's the better option. So if I have a fire, what I'm going to do before I shut the engine down is I'm going to take my fuel select valve and go to off position, wait for the fuel to drain out of the line, and then do my feather procedure, throttle idle, propeller feather, mixed rattle cutoff. So that's the, the only difference really between a, a failure and a fire situation. Uh, once you got things under control, uh, I said already you would... Um, do the emergency procedures checklist, make sure you didn't miss anything because you know the emergency procedure checklist would have maybe some items on there that you might've forgotten, like the fuel transfer. Because even if I don't have a fire, but um, I've got one engine operating and the other one's failed, I want to make sure that I keep the fuel balanced in the tanks at all times. So I would wanna do something called cross-feed fuel from the, uh, the full tank to the, uh, the good engine. Because if I just start burning fuel on the one side that has the engine operating, eventually that tank's gonna get low and I'll have full fuel over here and the airplane might start to fly funny. Uh, now there are no, in the Piper Sem, uh, Seneca, there is no uh, fuel balance limitation, but in some aircraft like Learjet is a serious concern, making sure that you, um, uh, especially with aircraft wing tanks in general, that you don't exceed the bank or the, the fuel distribution limitation. So we say, if you don't need full flux, eh, no, no, you don't, no, 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 don't do that. Don't need my nice new computer scratched. Um, if you don't need full thrust, reduce power on the good engine. This will bring it within more acceptable temperature and pressure limits for longer use and less wear and tear. In the simulator, you can just keep it to full. We're not worried about it, it's just for fun. Uh, in the real aircraft, yeah, you wouldn't need full throttle. You could probably just bring it back to a reasonable range. Generally speaking, we say that when this aircraft flies single engine, the power settings that you use when you're operating with two engines are pretty much the same. So if I'm gonna be in cruise uh, flight, 25 inches manifold pressure is what I'd use. If I want to have a slow cruise, maybe 
20 inches of manifold pressure. If I'm going to be in a descent, 15 inches of manifold pressure. Same power settings, I would use uh, single engine, I would use uh, with two engines. Um, but yeah, you don't need full throttle because especially if, especially if you're going to be uh, operating in that configuration for a long time, it just, it just more on the engine than you need. But I would generally say that when it comes to the power setting that you use, just set power for airspeed. Um, you know what speed you should want to have, so normal cruise or normal descent speed, set power to maintain that, maintain your performance. And then I say aviate, navigate, communicate. So aviate, you're already flying the plane. Navigate, make a plan of action. Where do you want to go? If you're in the Regina practice area, you've had an engine failure, you probably want to go back to the Regina airport. Uh, so make a plan. So what's the active runway? Which uh, approach should I expect, expect to do there? And then communicate your intention. Squawk 7700 and consider making a pan-pan call. And the one thing I'll say about uh, the difference between a pan pan and a mayday, mayday call is what I'd use if I was in immediate life or death situation. I'm on fire. I've had a loss of control. I'm going down now. That's a mayday. If I have a uh, an engine failure, I wouldn't really say that's a, an immediate life or death situation. I mean, it's an inconvenience. It's unfortunate. It's, it's reduced my redundancy in the system, but... I should still be able to get home safe, provided that things don't get worse from here. So in that situation, I would make a pan pan call. So I'd say pan 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 pan. This is Piper Seneca, Golf Papa Zulu Oscar, Golf Papa Zulu Oscar, Golf Papa Zulu Oscar. I've experienced an engine failure in the practice area. I'm 25 miles south of the field. Uh, two souls on board, white aircraft with blue trim, and requesting a return for an approach onto the onto the ILS runway 13. This is Golf Papa Zulu Oscar, Golf Papa Zulu Oscar, Golf Papa Zulu Oscar, pan, 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 pan. She's still a kitten, so she's still got a ton of energy. And it's almost like, what is it? It's 11 o'clock at night here. And I guess she's got the zoomies right now. Uh, so that's the pan pan call. Uh, there's a bit of a debate on whether a pan pan call or mayday is necessary. And I've been to different companies and they've had different lines of thought on this. The, um, when I was at Jazz, that was the policy they had where unless it was life or death, it was a pan pan. Otherwise, it was a mayday. Uh, Air Canada, they had a different policy. They said any kind of emergency, no matter what it was, is a mayday call. And the reason they said that was because uh, they've had situations where communication issues were a problem uh, and that uh, people who did not speak English as their primary language <laughs> were uh, uh, didn't understand what a pan pan was. And there was a situation once where an Air Canada aircraft was doing a takeoff out of Beijing, had to do rejected takeoff. And uh, they made a uh, made or so they made a pan pan call and the tower controller acknowledged, didn't understand what it meant. I think they, under, they were under the impression that the aircraft had continued takeoff and it was a low visibility day, like fog. So they couldn't visually see that the aircraft was still there. Anyways, um, the ATC, the tower controller cleared another aircraft to land on that same runway. Fortunately, it did not become an issue because the aircraft that landed was able to stop in time. But, you know, the risk for catastrophic uh, disaster was pretty high on that situation. Uh, maneuvering single engine. Uh, the aircraft does fly perfectly fine single engine. Uh, you, if you have a choice between turning into the good engine or not, you always turn into the good engine. But as long as you keep a safe airspeed, as long as you keep a safe airspeed, you'll be able to... Uh, fly just fine single engine. And one of the things that we'll practice when you're single engine as part of your training is uh, uh, flying single engine, maneuvering up to a 30 degree bank angle and, and rolling out on certain headings. You might find that um, keeping the aircraft coordinated in those turns is a little bit challenging, but more specifically maintaining an altitude. I need to take a 30 seconds pause here to address the kitty, make sure she's happy. So I'm gonna give her some cat dip and that should distract her a little bit or just make things totally worse. So I'll be back in a second here. Thank you. So she's got the zoomies and I just gave her like uh, an ounce and a half of catnip. So hopefully I can finish this video before she gets tired of that stuff. Otherwise, this is going to be a disaster tonight. Um, yeah, so turning into the operative engine is preferable. Do whenever possible. So specifically, if you have an engine failure on takeoff, turn in the direction of the 
good engine uh, when you're doing a circuit. Uh, turning in the uh, inoperative engine is not preferable as it will increase the VMC. However, as long as you have a healthy margin of airspeed above that, then it should be fine. And that's what the second note here says. Engine failure on final. Now, this is a debatable thing where what would you do in this situation? And depends on the context. It depends on the time that I have. Because if I have an engine failure on final, it's obviously going to compromise my go around ability. So if I have the opportunity to land, I'm, I'm going to land, uh, to be perfectly honest, because uh, I don't want to do a single engine go around. However, I would endeavor to do my best to do the entire checklist and all my memory items as, as much as I could before I came in for landing. Um, so be very careful with this one. But my, my gut reaction says this would be, landing would be the preferable scenario here if you can do it safely. And that's the thing. There's a difference between doing this in a, sing, in a, a light twin and a, a turbofan jet aircraft. Turbofan jet aircraft can go around no problem. This was our policy at Jazz when we had engine failures in the... Uh, uh in the jet is if you're on final and you have an engine failure you go around because you've got plenty of performance and you've got the training and you've got the skills and the, all the equipment to, to do an overshoot single engine no problem um so the more important thing is get the checklist done first then come back in for landing if you're doing it in a light twin your your go around performance may be degraded and that's going to be probably the most important factor for you to consider Single engine approach and landing. If uh, landing single engine, treat it just like a normal landing, but remember to use no more. Uh, it says half flaps. So that's the one thing I'll, I'll have to, that's, this is from our old aircraft. We used to have a twin Comanche and it used flaps by measures of half. We use flaps, so we said 10, 25, and 40. Single engine, our flap setting is going to be 25 as maximum. Uh, only extend flaps further if landing is assured. So 25 will be the max that we use. Uh, and there we go, 105 miles per hour. And this is the same configuration we'll use if we're in either icing conditions or with a strong crosswind. So you don't always land with flaps 40 in this aircraft. Uh, it's a slightly faster approach speed. Therefore, it means that your aircraft will flare and float a little bit longer. Um, and you should have a stable approach, meaning not more than 1,000 feet per minute within the last 1,000 feet. Uh, and uh, yeah, avoid the single engine go around if you can at all uh, possible. Single engine approach and landing. So deflay, delay flap and gear extension. Um, no, actually you would uh, you'd keep, your, keep your schedule as normal. Uh, as long as you protect your airspeed, you'll be totally fine. Uh, however, in flare, it's important to bring both throttles to idle at the same time. And the purpose for this is also to get your, your gear warning horn to go off. In this aircraft, the gear warning horn goes off at 14 inches manifold pressure or less, at least according to the POH. In practice, it's actually closer to about 11 or 12 inches. So it's important to make sure that your gear are extended and have that extra bonus of having the gear warning horn go off in case they aren't. Making sure that the throttles are fully at idle before you bring in, come in for landing is going to be very important. Um, when you are single engine, however, a lower thrust setting does reduce your VMC, makes it easier for you to fly the plane. Yaw will equalize, as I mentioned before, that you know when, when you've brought both engines to the same power setting, both at idle, then that, that yaw from the operating engine should be pretty minimal. Uh, yaw will equalize and be easy to line the aircraft and touch down smoothly. Single engine taxi may not be possible because of this whole VMCG, the, your minimum controllable ground speed. Uh, and differential braking may be insufficient for uh, directional control. So probably best if you don't think you can maintain directional control just to stop where you are. If it's on the runway, so be it. If you can clear off the taxiway, hey, that's a bonus. Otherwise, we say we call it brown and we say we need a tug and a tow back to the hangar. Idle on landing, and like I said, uh, we want to make sure we are fully at throttle idle on the landing uh, so that the gear warning horn will give us the additional warning go off um, before we touch down. Uh, it says, if not completely idle, gear may not have been fully extended, and the next noise you will hear will be the scraping of aluminum. In practice as well, because this is a very nose-heavy aircraft, this is one of the only aircraft I would actually say to do this, to when you go to idle, take your hand off the throttle lever and put both hands on the yoke. You're going to double fist this uh, aircraft on landing because it's a very heavy to flare. If you try to use one arm, unless you've been really working out, your bicep strength might not be enough to flare this aircraft that you, the way that you need. So both hands here to bring the nose up, to flare it uh, will be important. And um, um, what else was I gonna say about that? Oh, and the flare attitude. So you might find that the flare attitude of this aircraft is a little bit more flat than you're used to. So you don't actually need to bring the dash all the way to the horizon. You're almost gonna be landing a little bit flat. Uh, you're still going to land on the main landing gear first. You don't ever want to hit the nose first because then you have the risk, the either the risk, the chance of collapsing the nose gear or striking the propellers on the ground, and that would be not a good situation. So I will I will demonstrate for you the first landing 
on the uh, Piper Seneca so you can see what it looks like, unless you've had a chance to observe it first as a passenger. So what I recommend is that if you're watching this video, then you're beginning your flight training for the multi. If you want, uh, ask me uh, to come up as a passenger on the twin and you can come up on one of our training flights and you can see how the aircraft performs in, uh, in the flare on landing. And if you've seen at least one as a passenger, then I'll give you the opportunity to try the first one. Otherwise, I want to demonstrate one for you. Well, we mentioned already, if we have an engine failure, we need to shut down the engine and feather it. And I briefly kind of introduced the idea saying that you turn the propeller flat to the airflow. So it's not producing any drag, but let's talk more detail on how that happens. So on most variable pitch propellers, the blades can be rotated parallel to the airflow to stop rotation of the propeller and reduce drag when the engine fails or is deliberately shut down. This is called feathering, just like a bird's feather. A term borrowed from rowing. Oh, I guess it's from rowing. Uh, on a multi-engine aircraft, feathering the propeller in, on an inoperative engine reduces drag and helps the aircraft maintain speed and altitude with the operative engines. Most feathering systems for reciprocating engines sense a drop in oil pressure and move the blades towards the feather position and require the pilot to pull the propeller control back to disengage the high-pitched stop pins before the engine reaches idle RPM. And uh, this is a really clever design because what happens is that if you have a loss of oil pressure of that engine, obviously that engine is failing and that's a terrible situation to be in, but because the oil pressure is actually what keeps the propeller in the normal operating position that when the propeller, when the oil fails, it just naturally fails itself. You still have to bring the, the prop lever to the feather detent to bring it fully to feather, but this is kind of a nice fail safe that even if you forget the loss of oil pressure by default will start to rotate it flush to the, um, the airflow. Depending on the design, the pilot may have to push a button to override the high pitch stops and complete the feathering process, or a feathering process may be totally automatic. We don't have an automatic uh, auto feather in this aircraft. We have to do it manually. Uh, and uh, we need to have an RPM of at least greater than 800 RPM in order to feather. And the purpose for that is that if you're doing a normal shutdown in the aircraft, normally your RPM would be lower than 800. So in a normal shutdown, you're, you're cutting the engine, it's a failure, but the engine isn't going to feather in that situation because it's smart enough to realize, oh, that was a normal shutdown. If you go with a feather detent any higher than that, say, oh, something weird's happening, and it will fully uh, go to the feather position. So let's talk about how the, uh, the feathering procedure actually works, what a prop RPM does. So you've got those three levers, well, technically six, because there, there's two of each. You've got two throttle levers, you've got two propeller levers, you've got two, two mixture levers. Um, so let's focus mainly on the propeller levers and how they work. Basically, when you're moving the propeller lever, what you're doing is you're adjusting tension on a spring. And this spring governs these things called flywheels. And flywheels are basically these L-shaped spinning masses. They spin really, really quickly. And what you're doing is you're adjusting the neutral position for these springs. You're pushing pressure on the thumbs, basically, to either push them in or push them out. And we kind of have to discuss the idea of angular momentum here, because if you are if you ever watch figure skaters, you know, when they're doing their moves, and they're swinging around and dancing, all of a sudden they bring their arms in really quick, they spin really fast. The, the quicker they bring their arms in, the faster they spin. If they open their arms out, they spin slower. And that's the idea of angular momentum. And the same idea works with these flyweights. So what happens is that, if you want to make the engine go to a faster RPM, so you're, you're specifically controlling the speed of the propeller. What you do is you move the propeller forward. And I wanna make sure I get this right. So you move the propeller forward. Yes, you move the propeller forward. It puts pressure on this spring and that pushes pressure on these flyweights. And what happens is that pressure puts these flyweights down. And what, they, what you're basically doing this is the equivalent of this figure skater pulling her arms in. So when that happens, the figure is, is going to start spinning really, really quick. This is a whole, this flyweight spin really fast. So what's going to happen is that the flyweight say, oh, I've, I've suddenly brought my arms in. I can spin really quickly. And as it starts to spin faster, the rotational speed starts to pull these out again, saying, oh, I'm spinning way faster. And now what you've done is that these will come back to an upright position. But by spinning faster, it's going to um lift basically this pilot valve out and it's going to shove more oil into the propeller hub and it's going to make the propellers go more flush to the uh to the airflow and because they're going to be more flush in the sense that they're going to be more if the air is if the air is coming this way the propeller is going to be more boom boom like rotating this way it's going to have less of a load it's going to be moving at a higher rpm so just to briefly kind of talk about this you move the propeller lever forward you put pressure on the spring the spring moves the flyweights in, they move faster, and then eventually they're going to start pulling 
pulling themselves out again. That pulling out feature moves the pilot valve up. It allows oil pressure to go to the hub of the propeller, and that moves the propeller to the full fine position or high RPM. And that's what allows the, um, the propeller to move faster. Then the, the same thing works in reverse. If I bring my propeller lever back, what I'm doing is I'm taking pressure off the spring. The flyweights move out, and suddenly like that figure skater moving her arms all the way like this. So all of a sudden that, that rotating mass spins a lot slower. So now it's going to push in because it's moving slower. And what's gonna happen is that you're gonna push this valve down and you're going to allow oil pressure to leak out of the propeller hub, which is going to move this uh, propeller to a more coarse position. Now, as I'm recording a video, a fire alarm. I have a way to reset it. Give me a second here, guys. That might go off again. It's minus 46 degrees outside right now, and it's playing playing games with a ducting system in my apartment. Um, so this is why I'm staying busy. You know, if, if I can't fly or brief, I'm doing this. Um, but that might happen again in a little bit. So I might get fire trucks out my window here in a, in a short moment. But anyway, so when the propeller goes to the course position, um, you're leaking oil out of the hub. And the way that the, pro the propeller hub can basically be thought of to, to work is that you've got forces acting on both sides of the propeller. I've got on, it's a bad picture for this, but on this side, let's imagine I have oil pressure that's pushing the, um, the propeller to a more fine position. And over here, I have nitrogen gas that is pushing it to a more coarse position. So we said earlier that in some aircraft, if you lose oil pressure entirely and all this oil pressure just leaks out of the system, this nitrogen gas here and the spring that's associated with will push this propeller into the feathered position automatically. Uh, it's not always nitrogen gas. They can use just normal air as long as it's dry and there's no moisture content in. Uh, and that's the system that we have in our uh, Piper Seneca. Some other aircraft has oil on both sides, and depending on the design, uh, depending on where the failure happens, the oil that's in the hub will push the propeller to the feather position. But that's the, the basic premise here. So uh, I won't dwell too much on that. We'll keep moving forward. So we say there are several systems uh, that can be used to control propellers. There are single acting systems with a spring and blade counterweight. So that's what we have, the single system where it's oil pressure drives the propeller to the full fine position. Um, and then a loss of oil pressure drives it to the feather position in addition to the nitrogen pushing it. Or the double acting systems where either uh, blade counterweights or a pitch lock, system, uh, pitch lock mechanism is used. We don't have those as something more sophisticated aircraft, so I'm not going to dwell on it. The one common feature of both of these propeller control systems is that they all use hydraulic pressure acting on a piston to change the pitch angle of the blades. All right, now let's talk about kind of how we can think about the, uh, the propeller and the, uh, the manifold pressure and how, how this kind of equates to your former you know, experience with flying a single engine aircraft. So this is actually a picture, um, no, this is not the Seneca. But it's got the same idea. So you've got two mixture knobs here. You've got two propeller knobs here. You've got two throttle knobs here. Mixture that just controls the flow of fuel into the cylinders. Uh, propeller that controls the RPM of the propeller. And uh, the black knobs here controls the speed of the engine. So there's a, two different things happening. Speed of the engine, speed of the props. If you're flying an aircraft with a constant speed prop, which means that you have control, you're controlling the speed of that propeller, and it's trying to modulate the pitch of the blade angle to hold a certain RPM, a constant speed, also sometimes referred to as a variable pitch propeller, the pilot has the ability to independently control the speed of the engine and the speed of the propeller. The first lever, the throttle, maintains uh, controls manifold pressure, specifically the amount of suck of fuel into the cylinders. Right? Manifold pressure is a measure of um, pressure, basically. And uh, the higher the manifold pressure, the more fuel is being sucked into the engine, the faster those cylinders are going to be firing. The second lever, the prop or the pitch, sometimes referred to, controls the propeller RPM. We just talked about how it uses the flyweights to, um, to modulate the RPM. Um, and you'll sometimes hear me refer to that. I don't always go mixture full reg propeller to, to max and throttle the full. Sometimes I just say in an engine out failure, mixture pitch power because it rolls off the tongue a little bit easier, uh, but they mean the same thing. Pitch of, a, pitch of the propeller blades. Manifold pressure uh, is the pressure inside the induction system after the throttle right before the inlet valves, just before it gets into the cylinders. It gives you an indication how much fuel air is sucked or forced into the engine cylinder. 
Uh, with the RPM control lever, you control a governor that sets the propeller's pitch so that the RPM you dialed in is held regardless within limits of how much torque the engine produces. So if you find you're in a situation uh, and I set my propeller RPM to 2,500 RPM and I pitch the nose down, well, I've reduced the load of the aircraft. In fact, I put more, uh, more airspeed probably pushing those propellers faster. So what's going to happen is that those flyweights will sense an increased speed of the propeller. And as they speed up, they're going to spin out and that's going to slow the plant. That's going to slow the RPM down. It's going to say, oh, I'm going too fast. And now because it's that figure skater with the arms out, moves those weights out and say, I'm going too fast. And that slows the RPM. So that's how it controls itself. It's just an automatic feature of the variable pitch propeller. Now we do have instruments that kind of indicate to us what's going on. So I have a manifold pressure gauge and I have RPM gauges. Specifically in our aircraft, we have two different RPM gauges for both engines. We have a left RPM gauge and a right RPM gauge. In our aircraft, though, we have one manifold pressure gauge that has two needles on it. So you have to look at the needles and see which one is high and which one's low. And they have a letter L or the letter R on it. So you have to be careful with that. Um, interesting to note is that when the engines are shut off, the manifold pressure here just measures the ambient pressure. So it should be around 29 inches or 29.92 inches. Just nice to know when you're doing your walk around, look at the gauge. Oh well, yeah, 29.92. Um, yeah, so in the, so this is the, the manifold pressure type gauge that we have. Our manifold pressure actually goes quite a bit higher than 35. Um, the manifold pressure for our aircraft is between 35 to 40 on takeoff and 40 is going to be the max. Anything greater than 40, inches of manifold pressure would be an overboost condition. So we're very careful not to go too high with the manifold pressure. So in the PA-34, the left and right RPM are separate gauges, but the left and right manifold pressure are on the same instrument. Be careful not to confuse the leftmost needle with the left engine. So just because the, the left needle is low, doesn't mean that your left engine is the one doing the, the reduced power. You have to look at the letter on it. And that was a common mistake I made the first time I got in this plane. I wasn't getting used to it. So I saw, hey, the left needle is low, bump up the left power. But it was the right engine that was actually re producing reduced thrust. Uh, and they said they are labeled for added clarity. Uh, throttle lever angle. So this is the idea that, and this is specifically the picture from the Piper Seneca. So you can see RPM gauge here, RPM gauge here, manifold pressure gauge in the middle. Unfortunately, the control yoke is right up here. So it's a little bit hard to see. Uh, you're almost blocking your view of the instruments with your yoke. So it's just something you'll have to get used to. Uh, but the throttle lever angle, how far do I actually move these throttles up on either takeoff or stall recovery or any kind of maneuver? It's never usually more than half. So be careful not to push it too far. On takeoff, throttle should be moved slowly to allow, allow the turbochargers to accelerate. It takes a couple seconds for these turbochargers to, to pick up speed. In Regina on takeoff, throttle lever angle, no more than half should be sufficient. And it depends on the conditions of the day and you know, is it winter, is it summer, what altitude are you at? But generally speaking about half. Uh, the way to think about the propeller and the RPM and the way that we're kind of using this in the, um, in the aircraft, we say, you can think of the throttle as the gas pedal in your car. Increasing power increases the speed, whereas decreasing power decreases the speed. So if I'm setting a speed, it's always with the throttle. Uh, but you can think of the propeller control as the gear select knob. So high RPM equals a low gear. So if I'm going up a hill, I want to have a high RPM. It's like having the low gear saying, I want to produce as little load on those propellers as possible. Otherwise, it might. if I have a, a, a low RPM, my RPM is low. That means that those propellers are at a coarse pitch. And if I'm setting a high power setting and setting a high nose up attitude, I'm really putting a lot of load forces onto these propellers and that could increase the torque and it could damage the engines. So anytime I'm in a climb, my propellers should always be at max RPM or close to it, a high RPM setting. Again, we say we keep the propellers in front, we keep the, the props in front. So high RPM may be more efficient in a climb uphill. It's the equivalent of saying you're going uphill in a car in a low gear, whereas a low RPM would be efficient in a cruise where you're like, okay, I'm gonna bring my RPM back at least my propeller blade pitch is a little bit more coarse. It's grabbing a little bit more air. It's giving me a little bit more forward push, um, but maybe my engine doesn't need to work as hard now because it's the propeller that's doing all the work. So that's the way to think about it. Ceilings. Uh, this is a question that may be asked in the uh, groundwork for the flight test. So we'll talk about this here briefly. A service ceiling. This is the maximum density altitude where the best rate of climb speed, VY, will produce a 100 foot per minute climb with both engines at max continuous power. So at this point, full throttle, you're only getting at this altitude at full throttle, you're only getting 100 foot per minute climb. So you're saying you're still climbing a little bit, but you're effectively as, as high as you're really going to go. 
Absolute ceiling, this is the maximum density altitude that the airplane is capable of attaining or maintaining at gross weight uh, in the clean configuration at max continuous power. As altitude increases, VX increases and VY decreases. And this is just nice to know, actually saying, um, your best angle of climb, your best rate of climb, as you climb in altitude, those both basically converge on a single point. This is getting a little bit on the technical side of things with, uh, if you're going for your instructor rating, it's kind of cool to know about, uh, but we're not gonna dwell on it. Just know that absolute ceiling means your foot per minute climb is zero. That's as high as you possibly can go. Service ceiling is still getting hundred foot per minute. Absolute ceiling is, that's it. You, you've given it all she's got captain and that's as high as she goes. Uh, now, when we talk about single engine service and absolute ceilings, well, it's basically the same idea, but with single engine, the only difference with the single engine service ceiling is that you're only doing a 50 foot per minute climb. So the idea when you're doing the service ceiling with two engines, each engine is helping you produce 50 foot per minute climb each to up to 100. Single engine is only 50 for the one that's remaining. So this is the maximum density altitude at which the aircraft can maintain a 50 foot per minute climb with one engine operating at full power and one engine with a feathered propeller. This is critically important, especially when flying over mountainous terrain, because you need to make sure that you uh, you clear the rocks. Basically, if you have an if you have an engine failure flying over the mountains, <coughs> excuse me, I want to make sure that my single engine service ceiling, my drift down altitude, will keep me above the terrain. Um, so be careful with that. If the aircraft is above the single engine service ceiling when the engine fails, it will slowly drift down to its single engine service ceiling. This should be determined during flight planning using the single engine service ceiling chart from the POH. Don't take off and go into mountainous regions until you're able to make sure that worst case scenario, if I have an engine fail, will I still be able to stay above the terrain? Drift down. So basically what we talked about there is that if you have an engine failure, the plane will naturally be unable to maintain altitude with one engine failed, in most high density altitude conditions. So you're going to have to accept an altitude loss, protect your airspeed at all costs, sacrifice the altitude. So if you're cruising an aircraft at 12,000 feet and your minimum on route, or sorry, your, max, your minimum on route altitude uh, along that corridor is 9,500 feet uh, and your service ceiling is 6,000, then something doesn't add up there. Because if you have an engine failure, you're drifting down to six, even with full thrust on the good engine. And then if you're in cloud, you're not going to be able to maintain the airway. You're going to be potentially in the rocks and that's just not a good scenario so it says always plan for an engine to fail always hope for the we say plan for the worst hope for the best but yeah be careful with things like this so these are the speeds and the power settings that we actually use in our aircraft um we've talked a lot about the, the speeds already which is a nice little review so again rotate speed is going to be uh 80 knots our uh single engine uh climb out speed is going to be 105 our normal climb out speed is going to be 120 uh, landing gear extension, we use 140 in practice. If I'm going to extend it, if I'm going to retract it though, it's 125. Our um, minimum controllable airspeed is 80. Our single engine uh, best angle of climb, I think it was 90. Uh, and that's also our single uh, engine safe speed. And uh, our ref speed, our reference speed, this is something that might be new to you guys, is basically your approach speed on short funnel. When you cross the fence over the threshold, what speed should you be? 95 miles per hour is going to be the slowest speed that we use. Um, but we'll talk here in a later lesson about the actual speeds that we're going to use, say, in the circuit, because obviously we'll be a little bit faster on the base leg, and uh, we'll, we'll cover that here in a second. Climb power settings on this aircraft, 31.5. Uh, well, actually, I'll back up a step even further. On takeoff, I think I've already written it here. Takeoff power setting is between 35 to 40 manifold pressure, uh, 35 to 40 inches manifold pressure. Uh, don't be too hung up on getting exactly 40. As long as you're between 35 to 40, you're in the ballpark. The aircraft is already going to be accelerating quite a bit on takeoff. It doesn't have to be perfect. Somewhere in there is fine. Just don't go over 40. Over 40 is a no-go. Uh, once we rotate and I've got no more sufficient runway remaining, um, I'm going to retract the gear. And actually, that's something I don't think I've talked about yet. I did on the previous recording when I did this. And I've been talking for like five hours now. But um, on the previous recording that I did, I'll give you an example of a uh, takeoff briefing, because anytime you're gonna be operating a multi-engine aircraft, you should uh, do a takeoff briefing. And broadly speaking, you have three different things that you need to talk about. You need to talk about your normal takeoff scenario. You need to take uh, talk about your rejected takeoff scenario. And then you need to talk about your engine failure on takeoff scenario, all three of those. Uh, I think my catnip actually worked putting the, the cat distracted for a little while. Um, so here, and this needs to be memorized, just like the engine failure drill, you need to have this committed to memory because you won't have something in the, in the, in the cockpit to reference. And if you had a real engine failure on takeoff, you've got so little time, you don't have time to look at a checklist. You need to know 
immediately what to do. So let me give you the briefing that we currently have at the Regina Flying Club for the Piper Seneca. So I say this is going to be a normal takeoff on runway 31. I'm going to rotate at 80 miles per hour, climb out at 120, and I will retract the gear when there's no more sufficient runway remaining to land. In the event of an engine failure on takeoff, I'm going to close both throttles, land straight ahead, and come to a stop on the remaining runway. In the event of an engine failure on takeoff with insufficient runway, I'm going to um, do my engine out drill, which is control, power, drag, mixture full rich, throttles to um, propellers to full, propellers to max RPM, throttles full, flaps up, gear up, identify, verify, feather the failed engine, and continue my climb at 105 miles per hour runway heading to circuit altitude. And then I will request a circuit in the direction of my good engine. Do you have any questions? So that is the, uh, the, the whole spiel for the uh, takeoff briefing. So uh, at the beginning stages of your training, you will need to uh, start practicing that at least, that it will need to be committed to memory by the time you get to your flight test. And usually people are ready for flight tests around eight to 10 hours of flight training in the twin, or generally speaking, maybe six to seven flights. So it comes fairly quick. So don't dilly dally on, on getting practiced with that. Um, but talk about the takeoff power settings. We say 35 to 40 inches manifold pressure is what I said on takeoff. And by the time you have the power set, the aircraft's already easily accelerating through 50 or 60 miles per hour. So then your eyes are already outside and focusing on steering the plane down the runway. Rotate at 80. Once you get airborne, I'm watching the end of the runway when there's no more sufficient runway remaining. That's when I bring my gear up. It's going to retract. It's going to take about you know five to six seconds to fully retract. And then once the gear is fully retracted, then I will set my climb power of 31.5 inches manifold pressure and 2,450 RPM. Um, later on, when I hit cruise, if I'm going out to the practice area, I want to do cruise, then I can set anywhere between 25 to 29 inches manifold pressure and 2,400 RPM. Uh, if I'm just going to be staying in the circuit, though, I don't need that high of a power setting. 25 to 29 inches manifold pressure in this aircraft gives you around 140 to 160 miles per hour. In the circuit, that's just way too fast for us. So that's why I say circuit power is a little bit less. Uh, 18 to 20 inches manifold pressure gives you around uh, 120 miles per hour. And that's a fairly comfortable speed in the, uh, the twin in the circuit. And descent power setting, it's a lot like the single engine, actually. Single engine power setting is 1,500 RPM, generally for most Cessnas. In our aircraft, we use 15 inches of manifold pressure. I hear a lot of guys saying, setting 1,500 RPM for descent. And I go, no, you aren't. You're setting 15 inches, but it's pretty much the same thing. Um, gumps. Now, this is another thing if you're going to be operating a complex aircraft that has a retractable landing gear, especially to make sure that you don't forget to put the gear down. We had a, recently a, a Navajo that came in here and landed and on a sky clear wind calm day, he landed with the gear up because he probably wasn't following his checklist and um, completely rode off the aircraft. So to make sure that we don't forget something as silly as putting the gear down, we have something called a gumps check and each letter stands for something. So the letter G stands for gas, make sure the sufficient fuel remaining, make sure the fuel select valve is in the on position. I can't really see, but I put my hand here and that's where the, the fuel select valve is in the cockpit. Uh, G, G doesn't stand for gear, uh, surprisingly. G stands for gas, make sure the gas is where it should be. U stands for the gear, the undercarriage. And we say when the gear comes down, we have three green little lights on the instrument panel that show me that they are in the down and fully locked position. And then I have a, a mirror on the engine nacelle from the pilot's perspective that you can see the reflection of the nose wheel in the mirror to confirm that the nose wheel is down and locked. So just an extra confirmation. So we say that we have three green, one in the mirror. I confirm that my mixture is full rich. Oh, I hope she didn't cut. My cat just walked across the board. All right, so I'm back to where I, where I should be. Um, I, I'd be really upset if she accidentally kicked me off this video after talking this long. Um, so three green, one in the mirror. M stands for mixture. Make sure the mixture is full rich. P stands for propellers. If I'm doing VFR operating, I just go props to max at that point, propeller to maximum RPM. If I'm going to be doing IFR procedure, this slide is actually wrong. I should say propellers max RPM at minimums plus 100 feet. Um, that's going to be when you get in the IFR training. For VFR, if you're doing a gums check, just set the props to max right away so you don't forget. And then uh, prompts. Props sometimes refers to um, fuel pumps as well. We don't actually make use of the fuel pumps in this aircraft uh, in real life because it's only used for emergency situations. So our pumps will always be off. In the simulator, you may turn the pumps on just for a good practice for something to do, but it's not a, an urgent thing. Uh, and S stands for seatbelt and switches. So make sure your seatbelt's secured. And switches is things like uh, your landing lights. Make sure that the, uh, the landing lights are on if you need them. 
nice thing about the uh, the landing lights of this aircraft is that they're in the they're attached to the nose oleo of the the nose landing gear so that when you retract the gear the nose the lights are going to point right up into the landing gear or the the wheel bay basically and uh, if the if the lights are left on it can you know overheat the area and it can burn a hole i will not burn a hole but leave a you know, mark, so to speak. A nice thing about the twin that we have is that as the gear are retracted, naturally it turns the lights off. So you don't have to worry too much about burning a hole, but still make sure you turn the switch off just for good practice. Uh, standard calls, I put these in here just for familiarity for what uh, airline operations is like, but you guys uh, won't really need to do too much of this at this point. Uh, the things to keep in mind is that with, if you're doing your checklist, please make sure to vocalize what you're doing just to make me put your instructor in position where I don't have to mind read to see what you're up to. So you can say, before takeoff checklist, uh, you know, gear, uh, I don't even know what it says by memory. It's, it's a checklist for a reason. I don't have to memorize it, but read it out. Read the, uh, read the thing, read the action, read it out. And then when you say, get to the end, say before takeoff checklist complete, something like that. Um, just so I know what you're up to. And even when you're flying in IFR conditions, call out things that you change or call out what you're doing. It just, it makes things easier. It's a good habit to get into. The more you, the more you talk, the better this training is going to go for you. So we say standard calls are intended and designed to enhance the efficiency of crew coordination and update the flight crew situational awareness, including aircraft position, altitude, speed, status, and operation of aircraft systems. It's a really broad catch-all term. Standard calls should be practical, concise, unambiguous, and consistent with the aircraft design and operating philosophy. Use of standard calls and acknowledgments reduce risk of tactical short-term decision-making errors. Um, or in selecting modes and setting targets for or selecting aircraft configurations. So you almost kind of get into a script. It's like a play, like you're an actor. You say the same things over and over often enough, like even like your, your gums check here, it should become habit. And that habit will protect you so that you will always do things in the same way and you won't miss anything. Now, specifically standard calls refers to situations when you're in a two crew environment, you're working with uh, either a captain or first officer. And so what you'll say something, he'll acknowledge and he'll say something and you'll acknowledge. But uh, you know, the more you talk, the better it is. Some standard call examples that you might come across, uh, altitude calls. And specifically, we would always avoid, avoid calls that use the words two or four because they can be confused with the numbers. I never say I'm climbing 3,000 to 4,000 or 3,000 for 4,000 because those are terrible words. It's easy to get that confused. So we say 3,000 climbing 4,000, 4,000 descending 3,000. We're not actually going to do this in your training. It's just nice to know. Uh, I would say leveling 3,000. Uh, if I was on the autopilot, I would say alts cap 3,000, something like that. If you're in the IFR and you see that the localizer needle is starting to come in, I would say localizer alive or local alive. If I see the glide slope starting to come down, I say, okay, glide slope alive. When my localizer is in the center or my glide slope is in the center, I would say loc captured, glide slope captured, or I say on loc, on slope. Uh, when you get into the and localizer and on loc and on slope refers to specifically an ILS, an instrument landing system approach where you have a ground-based nav aid. So a localizer is the lateral track that keeps you on, on, the, uh, on the center line. The glide slope is the vertical path that keeps you on there. So I say, I'm on loc, I'm on slope. If you're doing a GPS approach, however, to delineate that you're doing a GPS approach, the terms slightly change. So you would say, I'm no longer on loc, I'm on track. I'm not on slope, I'm on path. So I'm on track, I'm on slap. Uh, I'm on track, I'm on path when I'm doing a GPS approach, or I'm on loc, I'm on slope when I'm doing an ILS approach. So just different, slightly different words that you would use uh, to indicate what you're, what you're trying to do. Sterile cockpit procedures, I think we're almost done here. Uh, so a sterile cockpit rule is a regulation stating that during critical phases of flight, normally below 10,000 feet or in high density airspace, only activities required for the safe operation of the aircraft may be carried out and all non-essential essential activities in the cockpit are forbidden. In practice, uh, I, I put this in here with uh, lofty ambitions, but I don't think we're really doing this anymore. RFC will use uh, 1, 000, up to 1,000 feet above aerodrome elevation and the last 1,000 feet of any climb or descent. So for, and this is true for the airlines as well, below 10,000 feet, no matter what, you're going to be uh, sterile cockpit. And if I was climbing up to 25,000 feet, the last 1,000 feet of that climb, I'm not saying anything other than saying 24,000 climbing 24, or flight level 240, climbing flight level 250, and uh, calling out any other deviations or, or noteworthy things until the aircraft is fully stabilized. But again, we're not really doing that at the club here. It's just nice to know for going forward if you decide to pursue this as a professional career, which I imagine most of you guys, if you're doing an IFR or multi rating, you probably are. Any questions? Um, damn, that's, 
this is gonna be like a three or four hour video. This is way longer than I was expecting, but hopefully it's been entertaining. Uh, and even though this is a recording, please come to me with questions after the fact. If any of this didn't make sense, and I'm sure that I did my best to explain it, but um, you know, this should at least give you a good foundation of all, all the major items that we wanna cover. But you know, I am your instructor, you come to me. Uh, if you have my phone number, text me, call me, email, uh, and uh, we'll sit down and we'll make sure we talk about all the materials that are going to be important for any lesson before we go do it. But then my goal with this, this whole presentation here was to, to save us both a little bit of work. Because again, I went, I went into very deep detail here and I don't always do that depending on the time constraints that we have for the lesson. So you're getting more information here and it's cheaper on your pocketbook because instead of paying for, what is it? My my time is like seventy dollars an hour at this point. You can watch a video for free, so you're welcome. I I hope you appreciate the service, but it saves us both a little bit of work. Uh, anyways, uh, that's gonna cut it for uh, tonight. I uh, you know hope you've enjoyed, and um, best of luck with your multi training.